The chair notes the time is six o'clock. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of the members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Additionally, the meetings recorded may be viewed on uh, via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and the ZBA webpage. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A and Article 10, the Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw. This public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. We will begin with the roll call of the ZBA members and panel for tonight's meeting. Steve Judge is present. Ms. Parks? Here. Mr. Maxfield? Here. Mr. Gilbert? Present. Mr. Sloboda? I can see him, but... <laughs> now that I'm unmuted, I'm here. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Also attending tonight is Chris Brestrup, the planning director for the town, and Steve McCarthy, planner. Uh, we may have, and Rob Mora, I just uh, signed in as well, uh, building commissioner. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is section 10.38. Specific findings from that section must be made for our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and recorded by town staff. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen via Zoom. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address for the board for the record and all questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where the information about a project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is where the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. Mm -hmm. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily, for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed with the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there's a 20 daily appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in Superior Court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the Registry of Deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, public hearing ZBA FY 2023-09. An Susan trustee, Yu Pang Zhang, requests a special permit to modify previously approved special permit ZBA FY 2009-16 for the proposed modification to conditions three, four, six, nine, and 10 as they relate to the changes to the site plan and management plan under sections 10.33 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw. Located at 290 West Street, map 20A, parcel 39, neighborhood residential RN zoning district. ZBA FY 2023-10, College Street 1957, LLC, care of Valley Property Management. Requests a special permit to construct a building addition to, and to allow a change from the use from a one family detached dwelling to a non owner occupied duplex dwelling under sections 3.3211 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw, located at 300 West Street, Map 20A, Parcel 101, Neighborhood Residential RN Zoning District. A public meeting, ZBA 2006 
A new owner, Amit Kajua, requests approval of a new sign and a new with a new name of the business, Campus Pisa, formerly Sunset Pisa, and a review of the special permit and management plan in light of the change in ownership under conditions five, seven, and nine of special permit ZBA 2006-0002-150 Fearing Street, Map 11C, Partial 36. And that is, I don't have a zoning district for that. Following that a discussion, format for the Zoning Board of Appeals meetings in person or virtual. And lastly, a general comment period on anything not on the, our agenda tonight. And then any new business. Are there any disclosures by members of the ZBA regarding tonight's agenda? Then our first order of business is a public hearing, FY2023-09. Han Susan Trustee Yu Pang Zhang request a special permit to modify the previously approved special permit ZBA FY 2009 16 for the proposed, mod proposed modification to conditions 3, 4, 6, 9, 10 as they relate to proposed changes to the site plan and management plan under sections 10.33 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw. Located at 290 West Street, Map 20A, Parcel 39, Neighborhood Residential RN Zoning District. Uh, we conducted a site visit on Wednesday. Uh, I'm going to go through that site visit. I know that uh, Mr. Slaughter, as well as um, uh, Ms. Brestrup, was at were, was at the site visit. And so, please add anything that I may have um, um, not mentioned. So, um, one of the things we did, we reviewed the post lights out in front of 290. Um, we looked at the screening from the existing. Um, Parking lot and screening that's going to be removed, vegetation that's going to be removed, and the new plant where the location of where new planting would take place. Um, we looked at some of the uh, land, the foundation planting that is not there, um, but was called for in the original site plan, which is not included evidently in the new site plan. And we generally went through the some of the items that differ from uh, the plans from 2009. And the new and the new site plan uh, proposed by the applicant. Uh, we also discussed. Yeah, that's a that's what I have for two two ninety West Street. Um, Mr. Slavita or Ms. Prescript, do you have anything else important to state for two uh, for two ninety? No, that covered it. I think that was it. Okay. Also, we need to go through public submissions or submissions totally on um, two ninety. Uh, we have a ZBA app, uh, application revised one. Uh, we have a management plan. We have an additional ref. We have some reference photos. We have a project description, a sample lease, exterior light fixtures detail and specifics. We have um, the FY 2009 amendment summary. We have a site plan, which includes a partial plan, a site plan sheet L, um, lighting plan, and building plans. Those are all uh, applicant submissions. We have a planning staff submission, which includes a project application report dated March 9th, 2023. And we have the applicant's waiver request from plan requirements, a building plan, and from the waiver of the landscape plan. I don't think we have any public comments on this matter. Uh, any submissions, do we? No. No? Okay. So then, um, who wishes to speak for the applicant? Um, I, I, Alan uh, St. Hilaire is here. He's the property manager. Um, I'm Michael Liu from Berkshire Design Group. Um, Alan, do you want to start and just give a synopsis or something? And uh, if there's some detailed questions, we can get into those about the site. Yeah, so uh, Mr. Chair, Alan St. Hilaire of Valley Property Management Amherst. Uh, just give a quick summary of what's uh, proposed here tonight <clears throat> and then turn it over to Mike of Berkshire Design to kind of get into a little bit more of the detail on the updated site plan. So this, yeah. this property was approved in 2009 to be a duplex and <clears throat> there is common ownership interest with the property next door, which will be heard later. 
and the purpose of this proposal is to uh, make some changes to the property line to afford land to the property next door and also to make some changes to the exterior lighting to uh, bring them more into compliance with dark sky and to also make them a bit more durable and protected from physical damage by getting them up onto the building as opposed to being up out into the yard. <clears throat> there are no changes other than the lighting to the building, uh, no real changes to the management plan. Uh, the site plan will have some slight changes with plantings and, and such, uh, but other than that, you know, the parking, the driveway, the curb cut, the access is all going to be consistent with the original plans. Um, Mr. Liu, can you give us your, um, just give us your name and address for the record? Um, yeah, uh, Michael Liu, Berkshire Design Group 4, Allen Place, Northampton, Massachusetts. Thank you. Um, do you have anything to add regarding the site plan specifically? Um, you can pull up if you want to for the benefit of board members that weren't at the site visit. Sure. You pull up the, the yep. site plan and just show us where you're going to remove the, the lighting and um, right. where you, and the, um, the changes. Can I, I'm having some trouble sharing screen. Mr. McCarthy, can you help? Give it a try now. Him. Okay, hold on. Uh, there we go. Uh, let's see. Let's see if, oops, wrong one. Hold on. Try that again. Um, screen one. That's some blue eyes. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> that's, that's actually kind of scary. <laughs> oh, here we go. All right. I hope you can you see that plan. Um, you sure can. Okay. Sorry about that. That's all right. That's too many. Nice. There's too many screens popping up there. Too many choices. Yeah. Um, not, a, not a problem, Mr. Lou. Thank you. So 290 is the parcel that's outlined in blue here. Um, West Street is over here on the um, west side. Uh, I just want to quickly say this this project is very closely related to um, the proposal um, that you'll hear next for 300 West Street, which is this parcel in the red um, rectangle. Um, at 290, it's proposed to basically cut out this uh, piece from 290, which is um, highlighted in purple hatch, and add it to 300 bringing 300 into compliance with um, um, zoning dimensional regulations. Um, the remaining land at 290 would also still be in compliance with the um, um, dimensional regulations. Um, and they're summarized here over on the uh, right side. If we have any questions, we can go over that. Um, but I'm going to just, I think I'm just going to stick with this plan for now instead of trying to hop around. But um, if we zoom in the brown, um, it represents the uh, building here um and i should say that this this parcel this was taken from a survey by um eaton associates so uh the the position of the building and the driveway etc is, is is very um is more or less accurate i'm going to say um but the driveway comes in off of west street here and and then enlarges to basically like a double loaded uh gravel parking lot shown in this dashed line right there um the the existing lights that were mentioned um they're not actually shown on here but they are they they run along this uh old gravel walk i believe there's five of them and then i think there's three lights out front here at the front from the uh, front stoop out toward west street some of these I, I at least one of them has been hit and it's it's kind of like bent over a little bit um, but they're very low um, mounting height. They're at a very low mounting height and they've been damaged. So in bringing this plan kind of up to more current um, standards and what uh, Valley Property Management has done with their other properties, um, it was decided to use the um, building mounted uh, um, porch type lights 
uh, to provide lighting into the parking lot and light up the walkways and replacing, you know, porch lights at the front as well. Um, and that's included on the um, um, in the site plan package. Um, the other parts of this uh, involve some uh, reorganization, I guess, of the parking. Um, these uh, rectang long rectangles here, eight of them, they're uh, the concrete tire stops that are proposed to be used to identify the parking spaces. Um, and then in the existing conditions, there are five uh, large stones along this side on the north of the parking. Uh, they're proposed to be relocated here to the east to help um, in preventing cars from, you know, driving off the gravel into the backyard, which is grass. Um, I don't know. If, I don't. It doesn't seem like there's an issue with that right now. When you walk out there, there's no tire tracks or worn areas in the grass. But um, we, you know, the applicant will relocate the stones to this side, um, and that will help, you know, keep people um, and visitors, et cetera, from, you know, driving onto the lawn area. Um, the dumpsters, they're currently, uh, I think that the, uh, uh, trash and recycle bins, you know, they're, they're basically kept outside here in this location. And I believe this unit keeps them over here from time to time. They get brought out to the street and back. Um, it's proposed to make sure that they are located at the rear, uh, of the building so that, um, they're not visible from the street. In addition, a bike rack will be added to the back here to serve both units, um, and again, you know, that will be also uh, shielded from the uh, right public uh, right of way here on the street. Um, there aren't any, as, as you mentioned, there are not proposed to be any um, plantings added to the foundation um, around the building. Um, that that is something that the um, applicant would would like not to have to do um, just to keep the site a little bit more simple and clean and, and um, you know, so that we don't have a lot of uh, litter and stuff accumulating, you know, in the beds. Um, part of this, uh, I just want to touch on. Um, I think one one comment that or question that somebody had at one time was whether or not any stormwater was involved with this project. Um, there is no stormwater per se for 290 because nothing's changing on the site. The the building's not increasing. The pay, uh, impervious area is not increasing. But part of the land that's being taken for 300 along here between the two parcels will be used for stormwater for uh, 300 West Street. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, let me see. I'm not sure I if there were some other uh, questions or issues. I know that, that there was some history with this site. Originally, it was proposed to have a, um, like a covered um, or sheltered garage. Well, not a garage, but like a, a parking um uh, can't think of the word parking shelter and and a shed for bike storage. Those um, I think that the applicant has stated that those are um, things that for, for whatever reason they were never they were never installed and they're not really needed. They they would just provide or or you know result in um, additional maintenance issues and trying to up with the upkeep, um, you know, and and wear and tear. So. The other uh, properties that they manage don't have such features and, and you know, bike racks um, and outdoor parking is, is perfectly sufficient and works fine. Um, so that is, um, you know, that is not in the proposal at all to add those elements back in, you know, as per the 2009, I believe, um, approval. Um, there is some vegetative screening that's proposed, but it will be along um, on the new property line for 300 West Street to provide screening between the two parcels. Um, this, the two parcels are in common ownership. Um, so, and the plants are, you know, are required to be maintained in perpetuity. So having just that screen um, for 300, for the um, development at 300 West Street, we felt was sufficient to, you know, to be uh, functional for, you know, um, keep uh, uh, acting as a screen between the two parcels. Um, I think that's it. And I guess we'll um, entertain or take any questions or comments. I, I just have a couple of quick comments. Yep, I have a couple of quick comments. The first is what you're proposing is a change in the site plan and then we adopt the site plan. And so um, even though the site plan from 2009 um, may not, 
The site plan of 2009 would not be in effect anymore. This new site plan that you've submitted would be the one you'd have to live up to. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Right? Yes. Yep. And so I have a couple of questions on that. And there's a list in the Apple project application report of some of the changes from that in the site plan to site to, from then to now. A couple of questions. It says parking place is nine. I only see eight. What, what, oh. what is it there? Oh, wow. Oh, I'm sorry. This is... Um... I, I think I flipped up a, a, a plan. We made the revision on the submittal. It actually does say eight part eight. Oh, yeah, on, on, exactly. On mine, mine right. it says eight. So I just wanted to make sure, right? Okay. And then, um, so I, that is P1, parcel plan one. And then um, in terms of the, the propane tanks over on the, up on top of the, uh, I guess it'd here. be, yep, right there. What's, I, I did I failed to uh, look at those during the site visit. Um, what is in front of it? Is that a, um, a a wood fence, some screening material, or what is it? Yeah, Alan, if you could clarify, I, be, I believe it's a six foot wood fence. Uh, it is a six foot vinyl fence. Oh, okay, vinyl. <clears throat> and I do, um, when, when you're done with this uh, line of questioning, I have a Google Street View loaded up to kind of show how well those are actually screened from the street. So I'm prepared to show that when the time is right. Okay, thank you. And then I just had one other question on in terms of the lighting. So the post lighting comes out and I noticed from the lighting plan that you've got um, lighting, lighting for the sidewalk that covers most of the sidewalk in the back coming from the parking lot and the additional lighting on the front of the existing, the lower, um, duplex um yep. you have lighting that comes there which is you don't have any lighting currently so that's a change from the existing conditions uh, in terms of the lighting plan yes. um, are there any other questions before we go to the um propane street street view that shows the propane screening miss parks hi i'm i'm just wondering i see the new property line Will the tenants at 300 be able to actually use that property or is that just for it to be a part of that of 300? In other words, is there, is it, what use do, does it have for 300? Um, Alan, I don't know if you want to take that. I mean, there, there's currently um, some existing vegetation here, um, you know, some mature trees actually, and uh, undergrowth that kind of bisects you know the 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 yard space um 300 yard spaces here um mm -hmm. this is green this is a, a green yard space so i you know if if, if um if the applicant feels like they, they want to add that or be, allow the residents at 300 to to be able to use this there would probably have to be some kind of path pathway developed through the woods there it would be a short run but um, that's something that I guess I, you know, Alan would uh, might want to answer from a maintenance um, point of view. Yeah, I'd be happy to add to that. The, the 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 biggest reason for that property line relocation is to afford the land necessary under the zoning uh, dimensional regulations. The property at 300 West does have sufficient recreation space. And so there, there really wasn't a plan to make that accessible to the tenants of 300 West Street to, you know, for throwing around a football per se, um, <clears throat> because there's there's enough green space on the other side uh, behind 300 West Street. I will okay. say that during during our uh, site visit, Ms. Parks, we looked into that area. It's pretty overgrown with vines um, and that area, the, the new area uh, at exact, exactly that area would take some work to make it um, accessible to residents of 300 to use it on a regular basis. All right. I guess I was just thinking that you were adding that that uh, land so that 300 was in compliance. And so it just seems like if you're adding it, you should do something with it. That's just an opinion. Hmm. Other comments? Uh, yeah, right, just a um, quick, quick point of clarification, uh, Mr. Chair. Yep, um, Mr. Gilbert. So, with with respect to reviewing, you know, the uh, the new proposed property line, uh, you know, that's going to get carved out and given to three hundred. Uh, is my understanding correct? I'm looking at you know your P one parcel plan here. 
is the overall dimension uh, or you know area, if you will, of that being driven by the requirement for the additional lot area on 300 of 6,000 square feet. It looks like based on what you guys are carving out that gets just above that at you know 6,001 square feet. Just trying to understand the um, you know dimensionality of that. Yeah, and that's uh, yeah, it, that, right? Essentially, that was the logic in in you know carving out that specific square footage is to bring right. 300 into compliance um, with with the Ooh. dimensional regs. Okay, right, yeah, because I mean, I'm just looking at it, and I was you know curious if it would make more sense to sort of chop, sort of basically like follow the. Um, let's say the Southern part of 290s parking um, rather than bumping it up and yeah. you know, grabbing that extra area. But, you know, understanding that you, you're just scraping by with the additional lot area of 300, that's, that's why you got to kind of, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. It, increase it, it. Right. It resulted in this big kind of bump out in the back. Yeah. No, yeah. Not, not a problem. Just want to make sure that, you know, I'm following um, what the logic is there. The other, <clears throat> the other comment I have is on your lighting plan. Um, you know, just taking a look, it, it, you guys are proposing these, you know, L1, L2s, and it looks like the only area where the L1 will exist is the south, let's say, uh, east south corner. East, right, southeast corner. Right. So is there is there any benefit of, let's say, uh, you know, keeping all, all these L2s and putting, putting an L2 there and then perhaps an L2 at the just northern south let's say east or just east rather i suppose east corner of uh of the duplex in order to you know just provide some more illumination towards those parking spaces um yeah there's it um i think i understand what you're saying so right now there's an l1 proposed at this corner correct west and then there's an the l uh or l1 l1 where your cursor is l2 above and, where you first showed. And you're saying maybe at one here or yeah or so with, what what would prevent you from say doing exactly an l2 where your cursor is now and an l2 at that bottom southeast corner um, i'm not i'm not really sure that would buy get you much um l the l1 um fixture in this corner gives you pretty good coverage through the parking lot except for this corner the northeast corner and the right. southeast corner of the parking lot i don't know if adding a light here would you know i mean it would certainly make the area brighter um but it wouldn't it might cast more light you know out to this space at the northeast um in combination with the other lighting but I, i'm i'm just i'm not sure that would would actually get you much um <laughs> Yeah, I feel as though maybe the only real benefit would be sort of walking around the building. From, yeah. Um, you know, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right, yeah. right there, around there. There is an entry here, mm -hmm. so you, you get better lighting there. Um, I don't. Per, perhaps another um, approach could be, you know, simply keeping that L1 where it is and sliding it up. Yeah. Just to the north of that facade a little bit, um, say where what I presume is like a. a shed or something of the sort exactly like right yeah, there that's a um that's a bulkhead and uh i guess we'd have to see where the windows are <laughs> um yeah but um I, yeah it was it was a little you know tough for exactly that reason whether you should provide more lighting than you need but right. i under, you know i understand we could we you know that would result in you know more lighting in this in this corner here where the two buildings kind of meet and there is a slider here and a, you know, a small deck. Right. Um, I don't know. I, I we could we could take a look at that. And if and if I don't know if Alan would be um, you know willing to you know consider even just adding one or or adding an L two. You know? Mr. Saint Hilaire. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that uh, discussion that, and and Mike kind of alluded to this. Mr. Liu kind of alluded to this where in prior projects we've done of this nature with these lights they are downcast they do distribute the way they're shown but they're they're quite bright and at the end of the you know the last arc in the yellow color it yep. doesn't just abruptly stop you know sure. there is there's yeah. continued illumination it's certainly something where you wouldn't need the flashlight on your phone to see where you're going 
And our concern was to provide adequate lighting, but not overdo it because a big concern is spillage onto the neighboring properties. Uh, the primary entrance is on the north side of the north unit. That mm -hmm. slider is not used as often. Um, and so that little bit of a, a slightly lesser illuminated corner uh, from a management perspective is not a concern. Um, and as I said, you know, if, I, I don't have photos of other projects as implemented, but uh, they are, are definitely sufficiently bright and there's no lack of visibility on these properties. So for concern of over illumination, uh, we felt that the proposal was sufficient. Yeah, I mean, if if there's also, you know, an architectural element as, um, you know, Mr. Liu alluded to perhaps a window or something, you know, just let's say towards that bulkhead, of course, you want to keep the, you know, the the more powerful, right, uh, light with, with the wider, wider spread towards that corner. So this is just food for thought, um, you know, considering somebody entering into that northern unit along that path. But, you know, if, if your, if your assumption is correct, and you think that, you know, that, that um, that foot candle will you know extend over adequately, and again, perhaps there's some architectural significance on that back edge. Then you know, then then that's fine. It's just you know kicking something out here, trying to understand you know why it's located right there and what that what that fixture change is you know sort of doing for us. Right. Um, that's that's all I've got here. All Thank right. you. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. Any other questions, comments from board members? Let me just run through here real quickly, guys, before we leave it to see if there, I had some notes down. All right, we dealt with the propane tank. That was my note. Okay. I have no other questions. I don't see any other hands. You can take down the screen share if you would, uh, Mr. Liu. Thank you. Good. Um, so there's no other questions from board members. Um, Mr. McCarthy, Stephen, do we have any, um, I'd like to go to public comment if there is any. Do we have anybody who wishes to? Um, I am seeing a no, no hands raised besides uh, Chris. Ms. Brestrup. Yeah, I just wanted, if, uh, wondered if you wanted to take up Mr. Uh, St. Hilaire's offer to show you a photograph of what the propane tanks look like from the street. And I think he was about to do that before. And, yep. that would be <laughs> and then I shut off the screen share. Yep, good. <laughs> Please do that. Alan, you should be able to uh, screen share if you try. Oh, you're muted, Alan. Thank you, Mike. All right, so this is the frontal view of the property on Google Street View. And uh, there are uh, one, two, three, four, five uh, public shade trees that were planted in front of the property that do provide some screening from the public view. And scanning over here to the far end of the house, you can see the fence that it was put in place as part of the 2009 uh, site plan to screen the propane tanks. And if I continue all the way to the edge of the property, uh, looking from the perspective of the neighbor, there's just a little tiny bit peeking out there and then you get into all this uh, natural vegetative screening that that's going to block it from view. So it, it is, it is, uh, you know, the large majority. There's two tanks back there. You can only see a, a tiny slice of one of them, is is in fact screened from public view. And while I have this up, I just did want to point out as well. This all of this yard space on the left side will be maintained for uh, the residents of 290 West Street. It, it's a big lot, and it's almost all maintained lawn so that that is uh just something i wanted to point out while we had this view up mr st Hilaire, i think at a site visit you mentioned something about um reclaiming the sidewalk in the front that had gotten grown over or some some sidewalks had gotten grown over um where the post is now is that sp supposed to be a sidewalk what does the site your new site plan uh do with that if anything 
Yes, Mr. Chair, the, there was a question in the project application report as to whether the sidewalks from the original site plan were implemented. They were in fact implemented, they're compacted gravel uh, similar to the driveway, uh, but for lack of use, they've kind of been reclaimed by the lawn, but we could certainly you know, reestablish those, uh, put some weed killer down and, and edge it. Uh, the, the material, of course, is still there. It's just been grown over by uh, lawn and, and weeds. I suspect it doesn't get much use at all because nobody comes in from the, very few people come in from the street. There's no parking there. That's so correct. it just would probably, it would probably look better if, it, if it's, you had a sidewalk up to those steps, but it's not because it's being used a lot, I think. Is that correct? I would agree. <clears throat> And lastly, one of the question I have, since you do have the uh, rocks here, these large stones here to prevent parking on the on from the street onto the property, you have eight parking spots in the back. Has your history been that that is sufficient for um, use of the tenants and any guests? The eight parking spaces. It has. We, okay. we haven't had any complaints uh, from the tenants or the neighbors for disorderly parking. Uh, and as you point out, those stones actually do run right around into the driveway. So yeah. there's really not a lot of uh, poetic license that the residents can take for parking. Great. All right. Any questions from board members? Ms. Parks. I, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to go to the site visit, but is the parking on gravel? Is, is that the surface for it? Yes, it is. All right, and is the parking for 290 changing or is that staying the same? Staying the same. Okay. All right, I'm just, I'm looking at Google Earth as well, where the, I, I don't know how old this is. So the, the parking looks like it's, uh, doesn't match what you had. Okay, thank you. You are going to, are you installing additional, my understanding is you're installing additional uh, parking concrete stops there, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so it should, if, if the site plan is implemented, it will look different than it does today. And that part will look different than it does today. Is that correct? It, it will look different in so much that it'll have concrete wheel stops at the head yeah. of each parking place. Uh, and that was to satisfy one of the requirements to clearly indicate the parking places. Uh, a lot of times on blacktop, you know, you can paint lines, which you can't do on gravel. So the, the concrete wheel stops work well as an alternative. Does that answer your question, Mrs. Park, Ms. Parks? Okay, great. All right, any other comments from board members? We have no public comment. All right. I'd like to move to the, um, while keeping the public hearing open, I'd like, to, in case we need additional information, I'd like to move to a public meeting to discuss the conditions and findings. Uh, but first, I guess I'd like to get a general sense of where people on the board, where board members are on the application. And, um, and if you've reviewed some of the proposed conditions, this is a good time to give me your, to share your thoughts with the, uh, the rest of the members on the, the first application on 290. Ms. Parks. Just a clarification. So we're voting on changing the property line here? Well, we're voting on changing the park property line. We're voting on changing, well, I, I don't, I'm not sure that we have to approve the, I think we, we have to acknowledge the property line changes. We are voting on adopting plan and lighting plan the management plan stays the same uh, but those are the essential changes and then there's some conditions that people have um, that, that have been suggested but i think i would leave that up to uh, mr moore or Ms. Brestrup to tell us uh, if we're uh, if we have to approve the lot line changes Ms. Ms. Brestrup. the lot line changes are really part of the site plan so um, they will go through a different process with the planning board, which is the ANR process. You've probably heard about that. It's a plan that is called ANR. It means approval not required, but the planning board has to sign off on it, and then it gets filed at the Registry of Deeds. But you are essentially approving a new site plan to fit within that new property line. So 
in this in a sense you are approving the new property line okay thank you great So I'd like to, for another general comments on the application, what I'd like to do is review the conditions, um, proposed conditions for this application and then go to findings. I find that I can't make those findings unless I know what the conditions are. And so what I would propose is, as we've done in the past, we go through the, the, the conditions. If anybody disagrees with one of these conditions or is uncomfortable and wants a separate vote on any specific condition, that's fine, we'll do that. Otherwise, I'd prefer to vote the conditions and block. I uh, just have one vote to the to the extent that we can do that. So the first condition is um, pretty much standard. We have to the project shall be built, maintained, and managed according to the plans that we've that have been provided, have been applied for, and those are listed in the in the proposal the uh, um, draft project application report. The second condition is this will, um, permit shall expire upon change of ownership unless prior to the change of ownership the perfected property owner shall appear before the ZBA at a public hearing for review and approval of the management plan parking management plan parking plan and lease agreement and to determine whether additional conditions are needed to meet section 10.38 that is um, has been one of our standard conditions that we've imposed over the last couple of years all rooms to be labeled on the floor plans with approval uh, with ZBA FY 2009 permit. So that maintains the same floor plan as previously approved. Any dwelling unit on the property being rented shall be registered with the uh, re residential rental property bylaw. The approved management plan shall be followed by the property owner and any changes to this plan shall, be, shall return to the Zoning Board of Appeals at a public meeting. No more than four unrelated individuals shall occupy each dwelling unit. All exterior lighting shall be designed and installed so as to be shielded or downcast and to avoid light trespass onto adjacent properties. Lighting fixtures shall be selected according to dark sky compliance and ZBA rules and regs. Street numbers shall be marked for both buildings, both units, I mean. Parking shall occur on improved subsurf or parking surfaces only and it shall be maintained. Uh, parking shall be clearly delineated. I think that the concrete uh, tire um, ramps do that. Individual parking spaces should be marked or otherwise delineated. I think the, the it does the uh, cement uh, tire stops do that. Under no circumstances shall the basement of either dwelling be used for sleeping or living place. No, the number of total persons per dwelling unit is limited to 10 or fewer people at any time. Um, and this total is, shall include the lessee and residents, so as not to limit a large number. So as to limit a large number of people on the property, any gathering shall be coordinated so not to co coincide with any gatherings held by the other unit on the premises without rip, written permission of the lessee lessor's agent. Um, overnight stays for any one guest limited to four days in any consecutive 30 day period or 14 days during the lease term. An overnight stay is defined as any stay within from the hours of 11 to seven. And the maximum number of overnight visitors per unit shall be four people at any one time. Those are from the, the lease on the property. I also, um, in the past, we have been also including conditions which require the, um, for non-owner occupied rental property, require the owner to number one, um, file any complaints they get with the town and two, to uh, upon their annual approval uh, application for rental, um, the rental project, uh, the rental registration regime that we have in town, that they have to disclose the uh, any any um, complaints they have. We've done that from in the past. Do we have language that does that? Either Ms. Brestrup or Mr. Mora, do we have language available? I have some language from an old. Um, I sent something today that we used yep. for uh, 51 Spalding Street, so you could take a look at that. I sent it on, in an email, and I no. um, cannot, I don't think I had the ability to share my screen, but uh, maybe Steve or uh, Steve McCarthy could bring I'll that try up. To, you can I give that a try now, Chris. 
Did you get that email that I sent, Steve McCarthy? I've stopped sharing my screen. Uh, you can give that a try. I can try to pull it up as well. Oh, I don't have I'm it. Trying. It's my. It's uh, an email that I sent this afternoon. I sent a copy to Steve Judge. I think I do have that, Chris. I wasn't sure if I can. Here it is. Not this one. Steve, if you allow me to share my screen. I uh, just so, are so allowed. Is this is this is oh this is one that I found on the um oh geez this is what we used at um fairing and fairing and uh, um, sunset and I'm trying to see how I can share my screen at this time Let's see share screen this one. But I, if I remember, Chris, you sent me something else earlier today. Here it is. No, I can't find that, Ms. Brestrup. I can probably find it and read it to you. Okay. This one, I think the one that I have up on my screen, is it being shared now, guys, or not? Can you read this? The applicant shall log and maintain. Yes, we can see that. I think this is more detailed than we've been doing for a lot of our um, other properties. But I think the one that I have used and that we have used for the last year has been the requirement to log. Um, I don't think we needed the, the specific violations of the lease. And this is a requirement for the applicant to log and shall log and maintain actions taken by the property owner. And then upon the annual renewal, these are happen these are given to the town. Uh, the complaint violation shall be given to the town and also available to inspection services. Um, Do you want me? To, I could work with um, Mr. Judge on the exact wording of that. Um, maybe tomorrow. Does that make sense? That does make sense. I mean, I think it, it, does anybody object to that regime? We've done it in the past. For the past year, we've been doing this. It seems to make sense to me. Any objections from members of the board? If, all right. If not, then we'll putting that language together and putting it in the conditions. All right. Are there any comments on conditions? Members? Does anybody wish a separate vote on any condition? If not, I move that we adopt the conditions on the project location report with the, Mr. Mora. Uh, would the board like to add a condition about maintaining the front sidewalk edge and free of uh, vegetation? Uh, it, it was talked about a yeah. little while ago. If you like that, I think we should make it a condition because it's not indicated on the plan anywhere. Oh, that's a good catch. Thank you. I would like to do that. I raised that issue. Anybody else? Object, Mr. Maxfield? I, I, I like that condition. Uh, I, I guess I just wanted to ask the rest of the board here. I, I've never been a big fan of the uh, conditions of, of limiting how many people can be on a, a property at one time in the special permit. But am I am I alone in that? Does everybody else uh, love that condition? Because because if we do, I'm, uh, I'm, I don't care enough to fight about it. But I, uh, <laughs> I, I've never, never been a big fan of that one. If they want to put in the lease, sure. But I, I just never liked that from the uh, the special permit. What's what's kind of everybody else's feeling on those that condition? I'll speak for me. Um, I know in some in some instances it's for the approval of the of the of the project to have a limitation on total number of people on the property at any, any time. And if you and I hate I hate to be in the position of saying, well, it's important we do it in X, but we don't really have to do it over in this other area, this other place. And so we tend to leave it up to the landlord to say, what's your, what are you comfortable with? And then, and then impose what the landlord has in the lease. And if it's, but if it's a really concerning situation where there's been a history of, of uh, large gatherings and the neighborhood has been object, we can, we still can impose a condition. Uh, and it's not just being, we're not doing it arbitrarily with one in one area, not in the other. So that's how kind of how I I have looked at it in the past. Try to because I'm sensitive to what you're saying. Is that why should we why should we um, limit that? But in some places, it's really important to approving a project. 
those limitations. So I, that's my thinking. Else? Ms. Brestrup? Can't figure out how to raise my real hand. Um, I just wanted to say that the um, in inspections and enforcement is often done on a complaint basis. So if the uh, tenants of this building have 12 guests and they're very quiet and nice, nobody's going to complain. But if they have 12 guests and they're really a problem, then somebody will complain. So it's not, you know, as rigid, you know, the police aren't going to come by and check and count how many people you have if you're not causing a problem. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's just follow up. I mean, my, my thing on this always is just if, if somebody wanted to like throw a graduation party for themselves, that was, you know, well, uh, but, you know, friends, family, that sort of thing, the daytime. Uh, if you just have somebody who, who does uh, complaint driven, does complain about something that I think everyone would, would agree is perfectly appropriate, but you, you just got a, a neighbor who doesn't like it you know, if they're now in violation of their special permit for what's otherwise, you know, respectful gathering, it's, it's, it's just the reason why I've never liked that condition. But uh, I, in a sense, too, I feel like it's, it's, it's also splitting hairs over, uh, I think, a, a, a niche case that I, I doubt will, will come up. But yeah. uh, Mr. Sloboda? I would like to be able to depend on people's set common sense and sense of consideration, but we've seen too many examples when that would not have actually worked. I think it's useful to have the limit in place. As Ms. Brestrup said, the police are not going to count noses. People aren't going to complain if there are 12 people instead of 10. But if something gets out of hand, I think it's useful to have the mechanism in place that there is an actual violation taking place as opposed to something arbitrary. So I think that this should stay, this condition should stay in place. And if it's not abused to the point where somebody needs to be called, it really won't be much of a factor. Any other comments? Mr. St. Hilaire. Just wanted to add a bit to that uh, conversation from a management perspective. And I do appreciate Mr. Maxfield's uh, concerns because there are plenty of vocal neighbors in Amherst. Uh, we get the police reports every Monday. We read them every Monday. And I can't believe that some of them are even calls. There are some legitimate ones, but there are some other ones that are two in the afternoon with four people listening to a radio having a barbecue. Uh, and I'm not asking to change the condition on this permit, but I do think, and I recall from a prior application where a neighbor hired counsel to wordsmith our lease, and we uh, insisted on the ability to give a written exception, and that was specifically to address Mr. Maxfield's concerns over, I'm going to have a graduation party. There's four of us. We each have two parents, so now we're up to 12 or 14 people in the backyard. It's two in the afternoon and uh, the neighbor uh, calls in a noise complaint and uh, to Mr. Maxfield's point, technically we're now in violation of the special permit. So I think that if the, if the landlord knew about it and signed off on it, it's almost like the party registration program that's in town where, you know, the issue is not going to be the barbecue. Uh, the issue is going to be the one o'clock in the morning with all the friends gathering yeah. from social media, which as property managers, we don't condone that anyway uh so if there is some mechanism in place where you know the property manager can take ownership or the landlord can take ownership and say yeah i can give an exception maybe three times a year for example or, or twice a year to allow some of these events that are harmless and and also keep themselves out of trouble with uh an inadvertent uh conflict with the special permit uh conditions in your experience have you ever had to have when you had one of those conditions, have you had been in uh, had any implications from the special the uh, validity of your special permit? Has it been threatened at all in any case? We or have you been have, able to work it through pretty much and go to the town and say this is this was not a problem and there was no implications for the the special the existing special permit? How did it work? 
we we have not mr chair i think a big reason for that is we only have a handful of special permits um yeah and i, I do think it's a it's a, a minute possibility and i also like to think that there would be some warning mechanism from inspection services before an outright uh you know violation was was issued and i'd like to think there's some room for interpretation i just do agree with mr maxfield that there could be a an unwarranted complaint could be yeah thank you mr maxfield i was going to say do we want to did, is, if everyone's all right with it, do we want to just change that language to do what I believe we had done a couple of years back with, I believe, uh, I think it was, was Mr. Greg Stutzman's uh, special permit where we just added language specifically to include without uh, prior approval of um, the landlord for any sorts of gatherings like that? Is, is that something we would, uh, we would want to, to include? Is, is there people amenable to that? A prior written uh, authorization, I guess. I guess we should say. You know, I I would not be opposed to it, Mr. Maxfield. But I'm just thinking that it's it's probably such a rare problem that we're we're trying to figure out um, a solution to something that doesn't happen very often at all. I really, you know, I I I, I don't know that that's that there are many special permits where that have been that are threatened or there's a threat to be in violation of them because of a graduation party or a, a 12 year old's birthday party or all those kind of noxious gatherings. And while there are, you know, Amherst is a town, I'm sure, where there's an awful lot of people who object to anything um, that I, I just haven't, I haven't heard of those situations really being followed up and, and threatening the special permit or threatening the, the operation. So and then we just, we're just putting another kind of bureaucratic thing in, in the lease saying, well, now if you want to, if you want to have that, as opposed to just going ahead and doing it, now you got to get something in writing from the landlord to do it. And then, I don't know, it's, it seems to me that we're trying to solve a problem that isn't a real, a big problem. And we're just leaving it, we're just incorporating what's in the lease anyway, for the, the landlord right now. Um, we're, we're not going beyond, not being more strict than the landlord is himself. But uh, I'd leave it up to, I'd leave it up to the board on that. That's my feeling. Yep. Ms. Brestrup. Doesn't the lease say unless prior written permission from the landlord or something to that effect? So I think maybe Mr. St. Hilaire can answer that, but um, I think the lease does give um, an ability for the landlord to grant a specific approval for some for one thing. And maybe Mr. St. Hilaire would be able to answer that. It, it does, in fact, Ms. Brestra, but I think Mr. Maxfield's point is, even if we give that permission, the condition as written forbades it. That's what I mean. That's what I was trying to get at. So the condition is not the same as what is as the lease. the lease. Yeah. Um, well, Mr. I, Maxfield. Uh, in, in that case, I, I, I think... Uh, uh, if, if we're really at the point of conditions, uh, I, I could just make the motion to, to adopt the conditions as, as we have them written with the uh, amendment, or I could I could just make the, to, the move to amend that that condition. Uh, yeah, you should just move to amend that condition if that's what you want to do. And then just just procedurally, so rather than to belabor this, do we want to make the motion to adopt conditions, and then I make the motion to amend the conditions? No. Is that I think what you want to what you want to do is you want to make. Uh, um, Mr. Chair, hold on. Yep, do you hear me? Yeah, I'm sorry. I think what you want to do is make a motion to amend condition 13. Um, oh, we have it in condition 13 says so as to limit a large number of people on the property. Any gathering shall be coordinated so as not to coincide with any. Oh, that's just for the next the next property. So I think you want to amend number 13 to state. The total number of persons is 12 is 10 um, unless you get um, permission from the land unless permission from the landlord is granted um, you can say written permission which would be um, similar to what's at the end of 13 
So total number of persons per dwelling unit is limited to 10 or, few, 10 or fewer people at any time. Unless, I would say unless um, written permission, permission is given from the less or lessees agent for a greater number. For a specified uh, number, I'd say, a specified number. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll move to just include that language of uh, unless written permission is granted by the, the less or lesser's agent um, for a specified number. I'll, I'll make that a motion. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Second? Second. Any discussion? All right, we got a second on that motion to amend. Any discussion? Okay, um, no discussion. There's a vote on this. This would be a, we'll need four votes. Um, chair votes aye. Mr. Ma Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Gilbert? Mr. Slavater. Aye. All right, no motion's adopted. Um, now we have the other conditions uh, with the, except with the addition of the sidewalk that, as Mr. Mora talked about and the uh, registration and, and um, uh, reporting of complaints language that uh, Ms. Brestrup and I are gonna work on. Are there any other amendments or questions about conditions for this application? If not, I'd entertain a motion to approve the conditions at, with the uh, as amended and as specified on the sidewalk and the additional language that we're developing. Do I have a motion? No Mr. Move. Maxfield, do I have a second? Second. Motion is seconded. Any discussion on the amendment? If not, the motion occurs, a vote occurs on the motion to approve the conditions as amended with the two stipulations as previously stated. Um, the chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Gilbert? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Next, we need to go to findings. Um, and based on the conditions we have approved, we make our findings regarding this, this particular application. And those findings are as follows. We find that the, that this is in compliance with section 3.3, .3, that indeed non-owner occupied duplexes are out in this, um, this zoning district. Um, it requires a property management plan, which it has, and which is provided a complaint response plan, which is provided and it's provided for either a management company or the presence of an on-site manager, and there's a management company here. Um, so it complies with that. It complies with Article 7, the parking restrictions. Uh, there's sufficient spaces required, and it complies with the, um, continues to comply with the um, lot coverage and dimensional regulation and footnotes under Section 3. Under section 10.38, and again, we're doing we're doing this the same way we've done the conditions. If anybody objects to any of these findings, make it your objection known otherwise, and we'll vote on it separately. Otherwise, we'll vote on all these conditions and, and block, or all these findings and block. Uh, 10.380 and 10.381, the proposal is suitably located in the neighborhood in which it's proposed. Um, the proposed non-owner occupied duplex is allowed within the RN district by special permit review and approval. The subject property is located in a neighborhood along a highly traveled road and, comp and comprised of a broad range of architectural styles, including single family and two family homes. 10.382, 383, 385, and 387. These are generally dealing with uh, nuisance and um, um, neighborhood, uh, disrupting the neighborhood. The proposal does not constitute a nuisance due to air, water pollution, flood, noise, odors, dust, vibration, lights, or visually offensive structures or site features. The proposal would, would not be substantial inconvenience or hazard to abutters, vehicles, or pedestrians. The proposal reasonably protects the adjoining premises against detrimental and offensive uses on the site, including air and water pollution, flood, noise, odor, dust, vibration, lights, or visually offensive structures or site features. 
The proposal provides convenient and safe vehicular pedestrian movement within the site and in relation to adjacent streets and property. Um, staff review and says the proposal does not constitute a nuisance to air pollution. There's little change in the uh, in the area. Proposal provides um, convenient and safe vehicular pedestrian movement within the site. 10.384, adequate and appropriate facilities are provided for the proper operation and proposed use. Utility services are found, um, there's no change. 10.386, the proposal ensures that it is in conformance with the parking and sign regulations. The, the applicant states that they're, um, they're, they are in, I mean, it, it is in uh, compliance with the um, parking spaces that provides eight and four is required. Proposal provides convenient and safe vehicular pedestrian movement within the site. It hasn't changed, um, and it, it currently does, and that has not changed. Proposal ensures adequate space for off-street loading and load. This is not applicable. Proposal provides adequate methods of disposal and or storage for sewage, refuge, recycling, and other waste resulting from the use. A trash recycling bins will be stored um, as per the site plan. Um, and they'll be stored in the back of the two of the, and they'll be brought out in the front. I mean, that was um, identified on the site plan and by the, and during the, the presentation. Um, and this, connected to the town's water and sewer. 10.0, the proposal ensures protection from flood hazards. Um, it's not in the flood zone. Uh, 10.391, um, historic features, not applicable. 0.392 um, provides adequate landscaping and screening of adjacent properties. Um, the proposal maintains existing landscaping and proposes new evergreen screenings to shield the parking from the adjacent property. Um, 10.3 provides protection of adjacent properties by minimizing intrusion of light. We've seen that in the light um, lighting plan that does not, what does not uh, wash over the um, adjoining property and they are dark sky compliant. 10.394 is not applicable to the project. 10.395, the proposal does not create disharmony with respect to the terrain and use of scale of structures. Uh, there's no basic change from in this, um, application to the to the building uh, the structure um, 10.396 the proposal provides screening for storage areas uh, that was that's contained in the um, um, site plan and the, the screening of the uh, trash and the propane tanks 10.397 the proposal provides adequate re recreational facilities open space for the proposed use there's sufficient open space on the site and 10.398 is in harmony with the general purpose and intent of, of this bylaw and the master plan. Um, demographics and housing of the mass, Amherst master plan states that the mix of housing should be provided to meet the needs and is affordable to the broadest possible spectrum of the community. The existing duplex helps this meet this need. Those are, the, those are our findings. Is there any questions, concerns about those findings from members of the board? If not, uh, I would entertain a motion to uh, to make these findings. So moved. Second. Ms. Parks moves the motion. Is there a second? Uh, second. We got to make these findings, guys. <laughs> we, we can't approve it. Can you? Or does somebody um, not want to make this? Is there a problem with the no findings, or just am I not hearing from anybody? You didn't hear us. Yeah, Mr. you Chair? have an audio issue, Mr. Judge. Mr. Mr. Maxfield Mr. approved Maxfield. Uh, seconds okay. the findings motion. Great. Yep. So before us is a motion to approve the findings. Any discussion on that motion? <clears throat> if not, the vote occurs on the on the motion to approve the findings. Chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Hi. Boy, I'm, I'm having trouble hearing anybody. Is everybody else hearing? Are you hearing everything, John? You are? Yeah, here, I'm here's mine. Not. Mr. Maxfield uh, affirmatively <laughs> accepted the findings. Right again. Can you hear me now, Mr. Chair? You know, I got these new earphones because I was, oh, these were always, my old ones were, wouldn't last an hour. And now I've just lost the, uh, Volume. 
For anybody else, it's good, but for the chair, you got to be able to hear you guys. Okay. We can hear you now just fine, Mr. Chair. So put those away. All right. So I had Mr. Miss Parks, I think, was a yes. Mr. Maxfield was a yes. Mr. Gilbert, aye. Yes, aye. Mr. Slaviter, Slaviter. Aye, and this. So <laughs> however you need it, you have the vote. We got five votes. Motion is it's unanimous. Now the vote occurs. Now the motion is to approve the um, to approve application uh, before us, which is special permit FY FY two thousand two twenty three dash zero nine. Um, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. <laughs> All right. The motion is to approve special permit application twenty twenty three dash nine with conditions as approved. Um, any discussion? If not, the vote occurs on that motion. Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Gilbert. Aye. Mr. Sloviter. Aye. Chair votes aye. The vote is unanimous. The application is approved. That's the first order of business. The second order of business is Uh, let me just get to the ZDA FY 2023-10 College Street 1957 LLC care of Valley Property Management request a special permit to construct a building addition to and to allow a change of use from one family attached dwelling to a non-owner occupied du duplex dwelling under sections 3.3211 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw located at 300 West Street Map 28, Parcel 101, Neighborhood Residential RN Zoning District. Um, submissions for that. We have, let's, let's grab the application report. Again, before we do that, we had, a, we had the uh, site visit and on items regarding 300 uh, West Street. We looked at, we spent a lot of time looking at the drainage area in the back of the property and the new uh, drainage that's uh, removal of the existing pipe and putting new drainage pipes in. We reviewed the parking area and it's moved, the moved uh, new parking area uh, where the curb cut would be. And then we walked the new lot, we looked at the new lot line, observed the property there. We observed uh, stormwater drainage in the backyard, as I said. Um, we observed the plan for filling in the existing driveway um, to, avo to avoid having water into the existing garage, which will not be used as a garage. Uh, we confirmed that the first floor is den will not have a door on it to prevent it being used as a bedroom. We discussed that the, there's going to be new vinyl siding on the, the property, um, on all the property, both the new and the old structure. And I think that was pretty much what we discussed. And we also discussed the kinds of plants that will be um, put in between the two properties to provide screening. Now how there'll be arborvitaes at starting at I think uh, six, four to six feet um, is what I think um, was called for. Anyway, um, Mr. Sloviter or Ms. Brestrup, do you have anything to add to the site plan? Thanks. No, I, that was quite comprehensive. That covered everything. Great. Um, submissions we have, we've received Submissions from the applicant, which is a ZBA application, a management plan dated uh, to or, uh, revised 2923. Additional reference photos, project description, vehicle and parking policy, a sample lease, guest policy, marijuana addendum, rules and regulations, policies and procedures for the rented property, mandatory recycling information, landlord disclosure of smoking policy, policy, exterior light fixtures, details, and specifics, bike rack information, site plans, which includes sheet P1, L1, L2, S1, L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, L6, which are lighting plans, demolition plans, layout and planning plans, and grading plans. Uh, building plans prepared by Muhammad Umar of Umar Design Services. Uh, we have sheets 1A, 100 through 106, and we have a stormwater drainage report dated July 11th, 2022, prepared by the Berkshire Design Group. 
Planning staff submissions include a property map, aerial map, topographical map, zoning map, and a project application report dated, uh, revised, uh, dated March 8th, 2023. And the applicant's waiver requests from plan requirements, uh, site plan, uh, sign plan is the only waiver requirement. Mr. St. Hilaire or Ms. Mr. Liu, who's representing the applicant in this? Um, yeah, Alan, um, you want to go first? Sure. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, both Mr. Liu and myself are representing the applicant, myself from uh, the management side and Mr. Liu from the site and survey. Side. And I know it's tedious, Mr. Hilaire, St. Hilaire, but we need your name and address just for the record. No problem. Alan St. Hilaire, Valley Property Management, Amherst, Massachusetts. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the the proposal before the board this evening is to uh, convert the existing single family dwelling to a duplex dwelling to provide for additional housing. Uh, it will be uh, all new construction. The existing structure will remain as configured with the exception of changing the garage, as you pointed out earlier, to uh, more of a basement storage space accessible from the exterior only. Uh, and there uh, will be a two-story addition in the rear of the property, uh, which would be to the east side of the existing structure, uh, which will allow for uh, a, new, a new unit, four bedroom, two bathroom. The parking will be configured as shown on the site plan. A piece of input we received from the fire department was to expand the driveway to 20 feet wide to allow for fire apparatus to get within 50 feet of the primary entrance of the addition. So that was incorporated between uh, submissions to the board. Um, there, as pointed out on the previous uh, proposal, there'll be some screen plantings uh, added along the new property line. Uh, to screen the parking from both sides of the property line. And um, trash will be stored in rolling 96 gallon poly containers, screened from view by the buildings. Lighting, uh, Mr. Liu will get into, but is achieved by the same dark sky LED downcast uh, wall mounted lights. And the existing property is a split level with a one car garage drive under and the parking presently serving that structure is in front of that garage. All of that will be eliminated and uh, infilled and loaned and seeded to match uh, native grades on either side of the driveway. And all of the parking will be consolidated to the newly proposed parking area. That is uh, the broad brushstrokes. If you'd like me to go through the architectural plans before I hold, uh, hand it over to Mr. Liu, I'd be happy to do that or answer any questions at this juncture. Yeah, Mr. Sandler, why don't you show us the um, architectural drawings so we can see what the new built, the new structure will look like, the new uh, duplex. Or we'll do, we'll get like. that open here. Yeah. All right, is that visible on, on everyone's screen? Yep. Great. So zoom in a little bit here to focus on the, the property. The, the hatched area, this is the ground level plan, the hatched area is the existing structure. This uh, area here where it says existing is the existing garage, uh, which will be uh, partially covered when the grade is raised on the outside. There'll be a hatchway like you would see into a basement to access this space. The proposed structure is um, these, this uh, 10 by 12 connecting room and a 25 uh, 25 and a half by 32, uh, 27 by 32 uh, footprint to show the room layouts. Uh, the there will be a slight modification to the 
existing structure. There's a, a bedroom with a dividing wall, uh, an area for a desk, an area for bed. Uh, this wall will be removed to make this one uh, continuous room. And the door on the family room will be removed to dissuade that from being uh, used as a bedroom. In the addition, uh, there, there'll be no basement. It'll be uh, much like the existing house concrete slab on grade. So there'll be no basement space below this. Uh, there'll be a kitchen, living, uh, den and dining room. The mechanical and laundry room will be located between the two uh, structures. On the upper level, there'll be uh, four bedrooms and a full bathroom. And the existing house has uh, family, living, dining, and three beds on the upper level. Uh, for the facades, let me get to that, the elevation views. This is the existing structure uh, as seen today. There's a small peak of the addition that will protrude above the roof line a foot or perhaps 16 inches. Other than that, there will not be any structure visible from the public way uh, as part of the addition. Uh, that is the west elevation on the east elevation. The, this section here is the existing structure and the gable end wall here is the uh, addition, the proposed structure. For the north elevation, this would be the end view uh, from the school side, the neighbor school side. This section, the gable end wall is the existing structure and this is the proposed structure. Uh, south elevation, very similar existing structure on the left, proposed structure on the right. Any questions about the architectural plans or any other elements of the project? You know, why don't we go to Mr. Or unless you have a, anybody has a specific question on this. Yep, go ahead. Ms. Yeah, Parks. I, go I ahead. have a, I have a specific, oh, sorry, Ms. Parks. No, go ahead. Mr. Gilbert. Okay, thanks. Um, can you, can you walk through what's occurring with the existing garage? Yeah, so the existing garage is a one car under the house. And the access to that garage will be eliminated when the parking is moved to the north side of the property. So there'll be a foundation wall poured up to grade uh, and a hatchway so that the space can still be accessed for storage, uh, but will no okay. longer be uh, usable as a vehicle uh, parking place. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, so uh, can you flip to the plan then of the existing building real quick? Um, I'm, so there will be, I mean, you said a hatchway, there, there should be a door. Oh, okay, hatchway door. I see what's going on. Okay, so that's gonna be, that's gonna be completely converted. The main entry to that house, should be occurring where that stairwell is. What's, where, is that just not visible? Did he just not place that there? On the on the architectural plans, it's it's beneath the overhang. Um, mm -hmm. I can bring up a photo of the house to show what that looks like. Uh, it's just an okay. exterior door that comes into this landing and either goes up or down to the upper level. So Okay, so it's at the midpoint, you hit the landing, and that's why we're not seeing it here, because this is below, and then I guess the first floor plan would be above, so you'd be walking down to it. That's correct. Okay. Okay, cool. Trying to understand that. Um, the other plan comment that I have is regarding let me see regarding the new build um what is the reasoning for getting all four bedrooms up on the first floor with one bath uh the main reasoning for that is that we are trying to build it to simulate a, a colonial structure where you have the shared spaces on the lower level and the bedrooms on the upper level and because it's being built on a concrete slab, the plumbing being upstairs for that bathroom 
is easier? Yeah, I follow the stacking of the bathrooms. Um, I guess my my concern is just having four tenants in that space with one bath, the other one having to be located on the downstairs, going down, flipping basically all the way back around. Had there been any consideration of perhaps changing the den that's shown on the ground level, which is immediately adjacent to the living area, which is half of the footprint of the house basically for a social space into a bedroom and allowing direct access to the bath or is there a specific rationale again to have those four up on the second floor uh, the other rationale is to uh, provide a bit of a separation from the common space and the sleeping space if someone wants to watch tv and someone needs to get to bed early it's a bit of a sound buffer and kind of keeps things a little quieter Okay. Um, We've got similar floor plans in place and haven't really had complaints about the uh, the inner functionality. Okay. Yeah. My my concern is just the four with the one up there, but um, you know, just want to voice that uh, sort of off the bat. Um, other than that, the only other question I have is the existing, uh, but, 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 but the existing building. Is that a one and a half bathroom? It is. Okay. So, I mean, in fact, for four, four tenants, in that case, you really only have one tub or shower for everyone. And that's, that's as it currently is, correct? There's no, there's no reno in place there. That's how it's built. That's correct. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Um, that's all. Yeah, that's all I sort of had on my mind here. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. Ms. Parks. I, I was just interested in that um, the the space between the two buildings is a laundry area. Yes. McCann, and I'm wondering, do both units use that as their laundry area, or is that only for the newer unit? That is only for the newer unit. Uh, okay. There is, there is no connectivity across this wall. It's It's a joint wall between the two units, but there's no connection whatsoever. The existing house does have a laundry on the lower level um, that's currently in use and would continue to be used. Okay, and then the area that's, that is directly below the uh, laundry storage, is that a green space? In the proposed, oh, here, uh, yeah. yeah, yes. Okay. That would be, that would be loam yeah. and seed for lawn, yes. Okay, all right, thank you. You're welcome. The questions about the architectural drawings, the set or the, the building plan. Okay. Uh, if not, Mr. Liu, do you want to talk a little bit about go over the site plan with us and uh, and specifically the drainage? Sure. Sure. Let's... Okay. All right. Hopefully you can see that plan. Um, okay, um, Michael Liu with the Berkshire Design Group, um, Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, looking at this um, illustrative site plan, let me blow it up just a bit here. Whoops. Okay, so on the existing property, this is the existing house shown by this rectangle. And just to clarify, there is the a front porch out here that's partially covered. Um, currently, people enter the house from the driveway, which would be in this location. There's a small set of steps that bring you up onto this landing and then into the door. Um, that would be switched over to this end of the um, landing when the with the new parking location. Um, but the addition is shown here in this hatched um, area. Um, let me, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the drainage. The existing driveway is to be removed. It's a, it's a, Currently, you know, you you get like four four to five cars parked in this driveway, and two or three of them are actually you know parked within the uh, the town right of way, because the house is rather close, and um, you know there's not much room to for uh, parking there in the pavement. There is a small area drain at the bottom of the driveway, about right there, and it's piped underground, and it runs around in this direction and discharges in the backyard here. 
There is an existing catch basin in the backyard, which essentially does nothing. It's raised above grade and it's in really rough shape. I don't know if you went out back and, and took a look at that, um, but it's it's basically like a, a, a structure that's crumbling. And um, it, as I mentioned, the, the, the frame of the uh, catch basin is set so that it's higher than the existing grass. So it, it really doesn't do anything except for the fact that the existing piping is cracked. So any buildup of water does get into the drainage system. Um, the existing drainage does is piped to um, southward to, uh, is it Mount Holyoke Road or Mount Holyoke oh, Drive? Right. Mount Holyoke yeah. Drive. So it, it goes out here in the southerly direction and, and continues south of this, whoops, south of this existing uh, house here on, uh, at the Abutters. Um, similarly, there's a there's a sewer line that extends um, along the east side of the property and runs southward into Mount Holyoke um, as well. So the driveway is going to be removed and will it, the front yard will be regraded with a swale. So the water will continue to flow around toward the backyard, but um, at the surface level instead of, you know, via piping. As much of that piping will be removed as, as possible. Uh, a portion of that pipe does actually run through the corner of, of this um, addition. Um, so the new driveway, as Alan had mentioned, we had some feedback from the um, fire department and they wanted to have a 20 foot wide um, access to within 50 feet of the uh, uh, front entry of the, of the addition. So the, the driveway was basically, we made it, this is um, shown in the darker hatched area. This is a 20 foot wide paved driveway. The parking spaces are, are along the north side and these will be gravel parking spaces, uh, 10 spaces in all. And um, again, we're gonna be using the um, uh, bumper, concrete bumper um, or tire stops to indicate the spaces. Um, in relative to the, uh, to the, proposed drainage. Um, the, the backyard will continue to be a low point. It's an existing low point and it's actually catching runoff from part of the neighborhood to the to the um, east here. Uh, water runs across these properties and through the woods and, and eventually ends up pooling in the backyard here. Um, so that condition is unfortunately, you know, I mean, we'd obviously rather not have that happen, but um, Water is flowing there, so we're we're the catch basin is proposed to be taken out because it's really not functional. So we'll have a, a more contiguous yard space here, but we're creating a low point here um, by removing some of the existing piping, and we'll have an inlet at the existing um, um, pipe here at the tree line. So the essentially the low point will be moved from the center of the backyard here to uh, along the south side, along the tree line. So we'll get that a little bit, you know, out of the way of the usable yard space, um, but maintain that functionality. Um, in terms of the new drainage for the, um, or the proposed drainage for the increase in um, impervious, uh, the parking, the driveway, and this, uh, the roof, I should add, we're, we're piping, uh, we're using roof um, leaders, gutters and leaders to bring roof runoff to this detention basin. Um, the light lines here you can see are contours. There's a bit of a swale on this end, but the main detention area uh, basin is here. It's roughly three feet deep, three and a half feet deep. Um, we'll, we'll catch water that flows off of the pavement and parking and is directed uh, by piping from the roof, the roofs of these units. Um, where it will, you know, enter and be attenuated. It will overflow back into the right of way uh, swale here. This um, symbol right here is a double catch basin. Excuse me, an existing double catch basin in the uh, town right of way, where uh, currently water, you know, is flowing to this swale and being caught in in, in into a piped enclosed pipe system. Um, our engineer did uh, communicate with Jason Skeels about this, um, you know, many, many months ago. Um, and Chris, I don't believe we received any comments back from um, engineering. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm assuming that Jason's taken a look at this. And I know he's talked about the design um, with our engineer. 
the um, the drainage does function in and meet uh, peak runoff in the two, 10 and 100 year storm events. Um, and again, we are providing some screening here as shown by these uh, tree symbols between the two properties and trying to maintain as much of this existing tree um, uh, wooded area as possible. Um, the the trash uh, litter will be uh, placed under the deck here. There is an existing deck and, a, and, a, and a, I think there's a gazebo in the backyard here that's all gonna be removed. The deck will be uh, made smaller with a set of steps that come down um, to the driveway here and to the parking spaces. Um, that'll be, um, you know, able to bring residents right up into that first floor instead of uh, at the bottom level. There is a slider at the bottom level underneath this deck. Um, so there's access, you know, from the parking area um, as well as, you know, access to the front. I'm not, I'm not sure um, how many people actually use the front door. Um, in this case, but um, there's certainly have the opportunity, given the layout of the parking, that people could enter, you know, either the front or the back of the existing building, and then obviously into the front of the addition here, um, in close proximity to the parking spaces. Um, concrete tire stops are also proposed at the east side of the uh, driveway and parking to um prevent people from driving off and in you know parking and using the uh the lawn space for vehicular parking um the concrete tire stops are easier to deal with with uh, snow plowing rather than large stones um, so the applicant would like to use those um, instead um uh, we're continuing there there are some existing stones that exist along um the front of the uh, property um, whatever is in the in the way, we will relocate to this side, to the southern part of the frontage on the road. Um, we are also proposing to add two shade trees here in the town right of way to continue that treatment of um, you know shade trees, um, um, the, the plantings that were done um, to the north on at, in front of 290. This is an existing tree that will be maintained. Unfortunately, there's there's also a, a large evergreen that you might have seen um, it's approximately right in this location. We thought we could save it when originally we, we had the driveway exiting onto West Street at 12 feet wide. But with the uh, widening of the driveway, I, I don't think there's any chance of saving it. And if we had to prune it up to, um, I believe it's a 16 foot height that the fire department um requires that we'd basically be taking off you know almost two-thirds of the canopy of that tree so um given its proximity to the earthwork and new paving we we just didn't think there was a chance of saving that tree anymore unfortunately um but we are providing a, some additional um evergreen plantings here to screen the parking uh from west street and um as alan had mentioned the 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 litter and recycle bins are screen from the road being placed in the back here. There's also a bike rack proposed to be placed in, in that uh, location. Um, I will go down to the um, lighting plan. Whoops. All right. Um, with the lighting, uh, we're proposing to replace uh, existing, there's, there's some type of um, lantern that hangs on a chain here in the um, um, on the landing here. We're proposing that that be removed and one of those uh, type L2 uh, porch lights be used here. There's an L2 um, porch light at the um, uh, main entrance to the addition here and an L2 uh, with a with a mounted shield to prevent spillage, you know, over the property line. Um, at this rear entrance here. Um, I'm not sure how often that will be used, but you know, it's a, I think by code, a, a light is required there. Um, and then one of the larger, uh, or one of the um, wall mounted lights that has a larger spread, the L1 fixture here, you can see, we are getting lighting out here, but um, you know, without adding more lights, um, which again, is, is probably not needed. You know, we do have, you know, darker areas at the, at the far corners of the parking, but um, as Alan had alluded to last time, you know, it's not a, it's not a direct cutoff where it's, you turn, it turns from, you know, light to, to pitch black. 
you know, it's graded out. So anybody getting out of their car, see or stew, you know, will be able to follow, you know, um, their way to, to, you know, get to the, um, um, to the buildings. It's not going to be, you know, pitch black. It's, it's just a very, very low level of light. You know, that's, that's below um, 0.2 foot candles. Um, so I guess we'll open that up now for comments, questions. Um, so the, Mr. Lou, the trees that you're going to, you're removing existing trees up here on this, the line here with the other property. Yeah. So yep. from the, the light from the car, from the cars parking. What are these arborvitaes and how tall will they be? Um, yeah, the, well, let me just double check on the planting. Uh, whoops, come on. I believe it's on here. Um, yep, we have um, our uh, arborvitae at five to six foot at at planting. Okay. Um, the street trees are are sized at two to two and a half inch caliper. All right. That's so my again, first yep. Number these, of screen plantings here and here. And along here. Okay. And then this remains this, this sort of thicket and trees off to the right of these arborvitaes remain. And they also right. like some shield. Okay. Correct. <laughs> um, the backyard is really wet. And does, yes. does the um, and I, I read through, I looked through the, the drainage report that your group did. Is the, the net result that the backyard will be drained of the standing water by the um, connection to the existing um, pipe that takes it out of the prop and moves it to the I guess it's to the south. Yes, we, I th we feel that um, um, this will result in less standing water um, because it, you know the water will continue to flow to that new low point. Whereas now, it you know if water built up, it would pool to a point right. where it would have to overflow into the into the yeah. structure. Yeah, the, the, the ground is sunk. Yeah, the, and, the existing. And Pipe. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Right. Right. And the soils are are silty back there, so there's not good infiltration. Is there any? Are you doing any infill? You're not filling this ground at all, are you? No. It's just okay. um, whatever's disturbed will be, you know, topsoiled and seeded, uh, mainly around the edges of the parking and the um, the new building addition. And then one other question I had is the um, this little. I guess there's a, a doorway here on the connector between the two units is that correct is that or maybe alan mr st hilaire you, know, you can talk about this but there's a doorway is in that connector which has the uh, the laundry room is this, is this your doorway and that's your second exit your, it is mr so chair you, that is the second egress uh, as yeah. required by building code and where would so then the the um, facilities the laundry would be on the opposite wall yes okay all right, and that's why, even though there's there's no sidewalk to this or anything else, is there? There's not a sidewalk back here. There's, there's a lighting to be able to get in, but there's no um, sidewalk or pathway. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, those are questions that I had. Uh, people have other questions. Members of the board. Mr. Sloboda. Oh, you're, you're muted. Okay, thank you. In the backyard where the water pools and there is that uh, above ground catch basin or, or drain, there's a large, fairly poor condition pipe partially above the ground that is that going to be removed completely yeah i mean parts of these pipes you can see they're exposed and not buried um this this p this is the pipe here's the catch basin um the pipe runs in the southerly southerly direction here and i believe there's you can see pieces of it here uncovered um you know opposite this um, planting bed and here's this four inch pvc that comes around from this um area drain at the driveway 
I think it wraps around and and comes in this direction and then just discharges. There's also another one here, which we can, we don't really know where that comes from, but that might have been you know part of the original drain, and then maybe it failed for some reason, and then this piece was added, um, or vice versa. We we we're not really sure, but there are exposed pieces of pipe that our surveyors obviously you know they picked up here. Um, so this all this smaller pipe is proposed to be removed as much as you know is found, and then um, this catch basin and piping until we hit basically the tree line here will be removed and you know we'll just it'll just be regraded and seeded um but the the there'll be a flared end opening added to the existing pipe here and so the new low point will be um in this area and water will flow you know from basically east and north you know toward toward that uh, new low point and we're using the existing drain to carry that uh, that flow, you know, into the drainage system at uh, Mount Holyoke Drive. Thank you. Other questions, comments, suggestions from the board? Ms. Parks. Um, I just have one more question about the bathroom situation. So are there two full baths in the, in the proposed addition or is there one and a half bath. In the proposed addition, there are two full bathrooms. In the existing structure, there's one and a half. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. All right. Um, if there are no other comments from board members, um, we could open this up for public comments. This is a public hearing. So, um, Mr. McCarthy, can you see if we have people who wish to speak to this, members of the public who wish to speak? I am seeing uh, no hands raised. We'll give it just a second for people to raise their hand if they wish. All right. Seeing none, there's no call for public comment at this time. Um, back to the any final comments from the applicant or final comments from board members. Mr. Lou, I guess the thing that I, the only comment I have is that I look at this and I see it's uh, 157, 156, 157. There's not much slope and you're, you're, you're to to gather that water in the backyard. There's not much slope to the to the um, drainage area, and right where you intend to put the right here. pipe, right there, it's a little bit less. It's a maybe a foot less, but you know that's not going to be yeah. perfectly accurate. Your right. your company did the the stormwater, or at least they they endorsed the stormwater um, study, and it's your feeling that that will be sufficient. To drink, not to give us a, a desert dry backyard, but to take away the standing water and move that away from the. the um, yes, I mean, we have minimal pitch from the north here where, yeah. where the 157 contour is, you know, uh, flowing south. But um, if, if that's problematic, this can be filled a little bit more to create a little bit more pitch, and which would result in a little bit more earthwork in the backyard. But um, there there is pitch according to the plan. Yeah get water flowing from the north to the south. Okay. And the catch basin, that new catch basin is in that lowest circle of 156. The new one. The new one, yes. That that's the okay. new low point. Yep. Okay. All right. Good enough. And then the other drainage areas up there by the um, parking area where you're creating this sort of a catch basin which has got, you know, three foot uh, three foot difference. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. About a three and a half up to the overflow right here. Got it. Okay. Um, any other questions, or comments from board members or the applicant before we move to the public meeting portion? Okay. I'd like to move to the public meeting on this, keeping the public hearing open for the time being in case we need to gather more information or need to go back in. Um, the public meeting portion is where we consider conditions and um, 
make our findings. Uh, first thing I would say is that do we have any general comments from board members? And generally, it's not a time for uh, for the public to speak. Uh, Ms. Brestrup, you can start. I see your hand is up. I just wanted to note, I'm not sure if you closed the public hearing on the previous um, case, so you might want to take a vote on that because I, you, I was reminded of that because you said you would keep this public hearing open and you kept the other public hearing open. So I just want to make sure that you close the other public okay. hearing before the end of the night. Thank you. That's all. Oh, okay. I guess that should have been in my motion to approve is to close the public hearing. I'll do that. Make sure you remind us to do that at the end of the, after we finish this. That's a good catch. Thank you. Um, general comments from people regarding adding this um, non owner occupied duplex. Ms. Parks. I guess I would just like to ask town staff about, you know, making this little, uh, it almost looks like a flag, you know, like a little flag backyard behind the other property in order to, uh, you know, have enough uh, minimum lot coverage for this new uh, new building. Does it matter that that new construction isn't really going to be able to use that space? Or, I mean, I'm assuming that there's minimum requirements for a reason. And so I'm just wondering, is there, are you concerned at all about, you know, this new construction that they can use that backyard? Rob, I'm looking at you right now. Mr. Mora. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not concerned about that. Um, you know, we do have frontage requirements, building circle requirements, uh, lot area requirements, but we don't have uh, width requirements or, you know, any particular shape. So um, it's not unusual to see uh, oddly shaped uh, parcels to, in order to, you know, just to create the lot area that's needed. Uh, I think there's adequate yard space, uh, you know, remaining for both properties, which we like to see. We want to see some amenity space, um, you know, but on the flip side, we don't want to see areas too large that can accommodate, you know, really oversized gatherings or uh, attract, um, you know, other, uh, un, I guess, unwanted activities by the manager of the property. So um, I don't have any concerns about it. Okay. There's no town, there's no requirement in the zoning bylaw that there be compactness, compactness of lots, correctly, correct? They don't have to be a, a regular shape. They can be, okay. Correct. It's not like congressional district redistricting. We can, we can gerrymander here without yeah. any problem, right? <laughs> I guess what's on my mind is also if one were sold to someone not the same owner, um, then that kind of use becomes a little unusual. So I'm good. I'm fine. Okay. Other comments, questions, or just concerns members of the board have? All right. Um, I'd like to do with this with the same process we used with the earlier one, which we tend to do is go over conditions first and then make findings. Um, the project application report has proposed conditions beginning on page 11. Excuse me, beginning on page 10. Possible conditions include the standard that the building has to be built as and the, uh, the um, site improvements have to be in compliance with the submitted materials. That's condition one. And it lists those um, submitted materials, including the building plans and the other um, lighting plans, demolition plan, management plan, parking permit, etc. Second, the permit shall expire upon change of ownership unless present Prior, unless prior to the change of ownership, the prospective property owner shall appear before the Zoning Board of Appeals at a public hearing for review and approval of a management plan, parking management plan, uh, that's the management plan, parking plan. We've got a, I think we have a, a typo there. Uh, this should read management plan, parking management plan, parking plan, I think, and lease agreement. Um, and to determine whether additional conditions are needed to meet sections 10.38 findings under the zoning bylaw. 
uh, butter and granola should still be made in accordance. That's number two. And, and Chris or Rob, is, do we have both a parking management plan and a parking plan? The In this case, we don't, plan, don't have a management plan. We have a parking plan. The parking plan is what you see on the site plan. And then I think yeah. there's also a written parking management plan. So they're both. Okay. Thank you. All rooms shall be used as labeled in the following floor plans. Uh, sheet A102, that's everything. And that includes, just for um, everybody's um, knowledge and information, no doors on the den. Uh, to make sure that they're not being used as a, as a uh, bedroom, an extra bedroom. Correct, Mr. St. Hilaire? No, good. Um, management plan shall be followed by property owners and any change returns to the ZBA at a public meeting. No more than four related individuals shall occupy the dwelling unit. All exterior lighting shall be designed and installed to be downcast. Street numbers shall be visible. Parking shall occur on improved, improved services only. Um, parking shall be maintained as needed. Um, constructed with, in accordance with Article 7. All parking shall be clearly delineated and shall provide with permanent dust-free surface and adequate drainage. Individual parking spaces shall be painted, marked, or otherwise delineated. And I think they're delineated through concrete wheel stops. Total number of persons per dwelling unit is limited to 10. I, can, I assume we'll have the same amendment that we had in the last um, special permit application regarding limitation and approval of, a, of the, um, the landlord. Overnight stays are limited to four in any consecutive or 30 day period and 14 days during the lease term. That's from the lease and the maximum number of overnight guests shall be four people. I'd also like to also include the, um, the two other provisions that Ms. Brushtrup and I are working on that we had with other uh, non-owner occupied rental properties. And that is the um, um, collection of information and the submission of that information when you get the annual um, registra rental registration um, application. And the limit on the number of people who can gather, right? Correct. And that's the, uh, with the written permission as amended in the earlier, in the last one. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. We'll mirror that. All right. Any other conditions that people wish to impose or consider or talk about? Are there any conditions that people wish to discuss or amend? If not, let's vote on the conditions and block before we turn to the findings. I entertain a motion that we approve the conditions in block as drafted and as amended by, um, as previously stated with the number of people and the, um, the development of language that Ms. Brushkrupp and I will provide tomorrow. So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's moved and seconded. Um, Who is that, Mr. D Mr. Maxwell? Maxwell. Uh, yep, I had the second. Thanks. Any discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the motion to approve the conditions as amended. The chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? That's a silent aye, I know. I can see it. Mr. Gilbert? Aye. Aye. Mr. Sloviter. Aye. All right. Motion carried, unanimous vote, motion carries. The conditions are approved. Now we have to go to the findings. Um, we have several findings to make. The first is that this uh, is a use permitted in that district and that zoning district, and that it meets the requirements of section 3.3211, which include um, a um, management firm to property management entity. Um, it includes a um, applicant management services, contact information, complaint response form, et cetera, are all provided. So I think we can find that uh, 3.3211 is met. Article 7, this provides more than sufficient parking. The dimensional regulations under Table 3, it meets uh, those. <laughs> the uh, requirements for the uh, the new dimensional requirements. Uh, 10.38 and 10.381 
um, deals with suitability of location in the neighborhood. Uh, it's a non-owner occupied duplex is allowed in this area and their subject property is located in a neighborhood that has a highly, very, uh, a highly diverse uh, source of um, housing and a highly traveled street. Um, 10.382, 383, 385, and 387. Uh, the proposal does not constitute a nuisance due to air pollution, flood, odor, dust, vibration, lights, or physically offensive materials or features. The proposal does not provide a substantial inconvenience to pedestrians. The proposal reasonably protects the adjoining premises against detrimental or offensive units, uses, excuse me, and the proposal provides convenient and safe vehicular and pedestrian movement within the site. Um, some of the plantings are, remain, others are, there are new plantings to um, buffer this property from the neighbors. There's also um, dark sky compliant lighting, which from the lighting plan shows that it does not bleed up into um, the abutting properties. And there are the trash and the recycling containers are um, um, kept out of public, the public view. 10.384, uh, adequate and proper, appropriate facilities would be provided utility services are found to be adequate for the operation of the, and the existing proposed use. 10.386, the proposal ensures that is in conformance with the parking and sign uh, regulations and uh, bylaws. Um, four parking spaces are required, eight are proposed. The proposal, 10.387, the proposal provides convenient and safe vehicular and pedestrian movement within the site in relation to adjacent streets, property, or improvements. Um, we can find that safe vehicular and pedestrian movement will be found on the site. 10.388, the proposal ensures adequate space for off street loading and unloading of vehicles is not, not applicable. 10.389, the proposal provides adequate methods of disposal and or storage for sewage recyclable. Trash and recycling bins will be stored, serviced via four rolling carts. Uh, containers will be screened from view. Water and sewer connections exist. 10.390 ensures protection from flood. It, it's not a flood zone, um, but the, the uh, drainage, storm drainage, which um, is proposed by the applicant uh, should meet the needs of draining of water away from this property and not onto other properties, no budding properties. 10.391, the proposal protects to the extent feasible, unique, or sport, historic, natural, or scenic features, not applicable. 10.392, adequate landscaping, including screening of adjacent residential uses. Um, we find that there is some existing landscaping, others will be added. Um, Arborvitae along the driveway and along the north edge and along West Street. Uh, there's stormwater, an improvement in stormwater detention and movement off the property into, um, into piping. Um, and the proposal also includes an addition of two street trees planted in front of Unit A. 10.393, uh, protection of adjacent properties from intrusion of lighting, um, light poles, Etc. Um, parking lot lighting, all or everything is dark sky compliant, and the lighting plan provides for illuminated parking areas and walkways, but not on to, not bleeding onto neighboring properties. Ten point three nine four proposal avoids the extent feasible impact on steep slopes. That's not applicable. Ten point three nine five proposal does not create disharmony with respect to the terrain and to use scale and architecture of existing buildings in the vicinity, which have functioned or bit which have functional or visual relationship there too. Within, um, that's, we don't have to deal with that. Um, down within any district provision of section three, which that to remain. So the staff review of the property is located in the RN zoning district and does not occur within the boundaries of a national historic di register district. There are several multifamily dwellings and single family rental properties along this, this section of West Street the neighborhood is comprised of a broad range of architectural styles, including single family, two family, multifamily condos and apartment buildings. There's also retail dining, bars, farms, commercial businesses and proximity to Pomeroy Village Center. Um, sections 3.321 um, deals with height, proportion, scale, shape, landscaping of um, two family dwellings, uh, meets the requirements of section 3.321. 
Um, there's no particular noteworthy neighborhood information, except that more than 50% of the structures in the immediate neighborhood are non-owner occupied rental property. 10.396, the proposal provides screening for storage areas, loadings, dumpsters. We've already just discussed that um, and it utilizes the building and screening from a new deck. 10.397 proposal provides recreational sufficient recreational facilities and there's op sufficient open space on the site. 10.398 the proposal is in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the bylaw. Section four of the demographics and housing of the Amherst master plan states that a mix of housing be provided to meet the needs and of and is affordable to the broadest spectrum in the community. With the applicant providing a second dwelling as redevelopment on an existing property, the proposal has met the intent of the master plan by providing a mix of housing within the neighborhood. The board finds that the proposal meets the applicable zoning bylaws, sections 3.211, 10.33, and 10.38. Those are the findings that we have to make. I believe that we can make those findings. Um, I would entertain a motion that those findings be approved. Ms. Parks moves. Mr. Sloviter seconds. Second. Is there any discussion? If not, the motion is, the motion occurs on the, uh, to make the findings as stated and block to agree with the findings in the uh, project app, app, draft project application report. If there's no further discussion, um, we will vote on that motion. The chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Gilbert? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. So we have approved conditions. We've made our findings. The vote now occurs on a motion to close the public hearing and public meeting on ZBA, um, what's the number of the ZBA? This ZBA 23-10 and approve the special permit application with conditions. Do I have a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? This requires four votes. I vote aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Gilbert? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Vote is unanimous. The motion carries the public hearing on ZBA um, 2023-10 is closed. Now I wanna um, return to ZBA 2023-9 and close the public hearing on that application, which we have approved. Do I have a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? If not, um, vote occurs on the motion. The chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Gilbert? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Motion is unanimous. Motion carries. Uh, congratulations, Mr. St. Hilaire and Mr. Liu. You have your two special permit applications approved. And thank you, thank you for providing much. additional housing in the neighborhood and for the thank town. You. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Have a great night. All right. The next order of business is a public meeting. A public meeting to um, grab the next thing. A public meeting on ZBA 2006-0002 with new owner, Amit, and you'll have to help me with your name, Mr. Kanouja. And Kanogia. please say it again for me correctly. Kanogia. Kanogia. Yes. New owner, Amit Kanogia, requests approval of a new sign with the new name of the business Campus Pizza, formerly Sunset Pizza, and a review of the special permit and management plan in light of the change in ownership are con under conditions 579 of special permit ZBA 2006-00002-150 Fearing Street, Map 11C, Partial 36. There was not a formal site visit in this case. Um, I drove by the property. I'm familiar with the property. I've walked past it numerous times. Um, I'm familiar with the old business sign and uh, and the and the uh, the business there. Um, 
Does any member have anything to add regarding a site visit or a review of the property? All right, the only submissions we have are from the applicant, which include a, um, a photograph of the new uh, sign, a management plan, the man an amendment to the management plan, which really just, which only, as far as I can tell, um, has the um, change in the name and the change in the sign. Everything else seems to be the same. We also have the old special permits um, from 2000. Uh, six, and we have special permit from an earlier time, 2005, I guess, when it was Chicago Pizza. Anyway, those I think are the, Ms. Brestrup, are there any other submissions that we have on this? I don't think there are any other submissions. I just wanted to point out that Mr. Kanuja's attorney is in the attendees in case you wanted to bring her in for any reason. Sure, just in case she needs case she needs to, that's fine. So, um, so who's representing the applicant, Mr. Kanucha or Mrs. Thibault? Uh, we're, we're actually both together. Okay. Um, both give your, some, both give your name and address and, uh, please provide a quick, um, uh, presentation for the board. Sure. Hi. Hello. Uh, Rebecca Tebow here from Doherty Wallace Pillsbury Murphy. I'm here representing Amit Kanuja. Uh, my address is One Monarch Place in Springfield, Mass. 01144. And Mr. Kanuja, what's your name and address again, please? Hi, my name is Amit Kanuja. Uh, I reside at 10 Shepherds Hollow Road in Leeds, Mass. 01053. Great, thank you. Proceed. So oh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak. Um, as you see, there's a special permit that was granted in 2005 and there were certain conditions on there, uh, including conditions that if there is a sign change with respect to the sign and um, if there is an ownership change that we need to come before this board for approval for these changes. Um, so that's why we're here. We understand this to be a, a public meeting where you'll be considering whether or not these changes are de minimis enough to just sign off on them as a, possibly as you did in the past with a memorandum um, as opposed to doing a public hearing. Um, Mr. Kanuja recently bought the business and uh, hopes to operate it and open it soon. Um, with respect to the sign, there really is no significant physical changes, either in how it's lit up or its size. It basically is just the name that is being slid into the old um, or the existing sign. And it's the same material and same lighting. Um, as you saw in the management plan that was submitted, that largely follows previous plans that have been submitted and uh, is responsive to all the questions on the application. There, there are no significant changes. Um, a little bit of background about Mr. Kanuja, and he can of course elaborate on this, um, but he, he's been in the restaurant business himself for over 20 years, um, you know, including in a family run business that's been operating in Northampton for about 40 years with a presence in a community um, he obviously cares about how a restaurant operates within a community. He will be personally on site and managing the business and, and present as it gets started under his ownership to oversee and make sure that it runs in accordance with the management plan that was submitted. Great, thank I, you. I think that's all I have. And if you have specific questions, um, we'd be happy to answer them. In review of the application of the uh, request to amend the management plan, which is I think about all you're really asking, it, the only change that I noted was the sign. Is there any other change that you're requesting other than the sign? No. Okay. I have no other questions. Is 
Anybody on the board have a question? All right. Ms. Brestrup, I think all we have to do is approve the change in the management plan. Um, is that correct? We don't have to um, do anything. We don't have to make any findings. This is a, a we, we don't have to go through 10.38 all over, do we? You need to um, approve the sign and acknowledge that you've reviewed the um, special permit and the management plan and then approve the management plan. Okay. So I think that's all you have to do. Mm -hmm. All right. I would entertain a motion that we approve the change in sign signage that we stipulate that we've reviewed the management plan and that we reviewed the special permit and that we approve said items. So moved. Is there a second? Second. I got a motion and a second and a motion seconded. Any discussion? No discussion. Vote occurs on the motion. The chair votes aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Mr. Gilbert. Aye. Mr. Sloboder. Aye. Motion is unanimous. Uh, motion carries. And congratulations. You've got your sign. Good luck with your business. That's been there for a little There have been pizza sold there for a long time. Um, I'm sure that it will continue to be sold there for a long time to come. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next order of business is a public meeting. We had noticed that we wanted to have this, a discussion about um, when we can have a public, uh, we have to, will we continue to have meetings via Zoom or we'll be able to meet in person. And I think there is some recent, uh, recent development on this. I have not read the, um, the email, Ms. Brestrup, but you did send me something, I think, that talks about a recent um, decision or um, a notice that we may be at a point coming up where we might actually be in person again. Can you give us a, enlighten us on this, what's going on? So um, the ability to hold public meetings um, remotely is due to expire at the end of March, um, March 31st. Um, the House in Boston has passed a, um, I don't know if, what exactly it is, but it's a it's a law that would allow um, remote meetings to continue through March of 2025. Um, the Senate has not passed that yet, but I understand that they're working on it. And we think that they will pass it, but we haven't heard anything to the contrary, but it hasn't been passed yet. So um, we may be able to continue meeting remotely. Um, until March of 2025. Um, I think this uh, item was put on the agenda at the request of um, a new um, a new zoning board member, an associate member, and you may want him to speak about it. I think he he feels that um, having meetings in person is beneficial both for um, board members as well as the applicant. Um, but there may be a difference of opinion about that. So anyway, this was put on the agenda at the request of Vince O'Connor yep. um, with the acquiescence of Steve Judge. So um, why don't we talk about it? We can talk about it. Um, but I know that Mr. O'Connor cannot be here tonight for this uh, discussion. He is here on the he phone. Is. He's an attendee Where? on the phone. So you could oh. have him speak if you wanted to. Yes, I, he was. I didn't realize that was him. So, Mr. O'Connor, um, you're the one that wanted to put this on the agenda. What's your thoughts? He has to unmute himself. Steve, can you help him to unmute himself? Yes, I um, <clears throat> I have. There he goes. There we go. Yeah, Mr. O'Connor. Yeah, I've been trying to get through for about two hours now. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll speak to this. Um, I I think that um, it's I think it's essential that we see people in person. 
um, that the zoning board sees people in person. Um, consultants and you know experts who want to, who want to provide information from their homes or their offices in Hartford or Greenfield or something like that. That's perfectly okay. I think we should provide for that that kind of an opportunity. And I think that anyone who has any kind of concerns um, that they made, um, you know, health-related con concerns and so forth, I, I, that they could either participate remotely or um, e either members or members of the public or applicants. Um, they could appear by Zoom or wear masks. But I, I think that the idea of having um, – I've been to a lot of meetings in person. I've presented three matters to the zoning board myself in person. I think it's it, – and attended and, and spoke at probably as many planning board meetings as any member of the planning board ever has. And um, – I think there's a way, just a world of difference between participating remotely um, and participating in person. And um, I don't, I don't think there's any. I mean, this is this. It's not like we're having a Massachusetts town meeting with the governor or something like that. This is a relatively small town. There's probably 15 to 18 thousand. Um, year-round residents, and uh, I have no idea why why this should continue beyond any uh, health health emergency necessity. I'm sure that there are public officials who would who would like never to see a member of the public in person again. And suits their style of governing. But I don't think that should be our style of governing in, a, in what is a relatively small town. Okay. Well, it seems to me that we've got um, a couple of, of trigger things that, can, that we have to look at. Number one, whether the state will continue to allow Zoom meet not in person and allow us to to continue to have a zoom meeting it may it may not and so then we have to comply with the open meeting law and so as of april 1st we could be in a situation if i understand it chris as of april 1st we could be in a situation where we have to have uh, public meetings and um, that's so that's one possibility the second possibility is that they do pass uh, legislation and that legislation says it's up to the town as to whether they want to have uh, public meetings or not, or whether we continue with Zoom, or whether we have some kind of a combination public meeting and a Zoom meeting and an in-person meeting. And I think that's really, that will be a decision that the town has to make and that will guide us and they will tell us what we can do in terms of, of having a public meeting or um, having a, a, a hybrid meeting. And the hybrid meeting is would be great, but there's cost to that and there's broadband uh, I think there's broadband concerns about the town, and so I just don't know if that's a possibility. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not yeah, sure. I, I'm not sure. Just a second, Mr. Mr. O'Connor. I'm not sure if we what the what the town manager or the town council will suggest at that point, but we'll have to follow what they what they um, tell us we can do, and what they and the resources. I am one who I have not been able to chair. I've said this before. I've not been able to chair. A CBA meeting in person. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a mm -hmm. chairman, and I would dearly love to be in person, if, especially if we could be in person with a uh, with the ability to have people still call in in some way into to hybrid. Um, yeah. For those who care about who, are, who who want the convenience of participating in their town town government from the comfort of their home, but that's a question of really of resources of the town whether they can allow that. So. Um, I would love to hear what other people think uh, about the possibility of of meeting in person or meeting in a hybrid status. Ms. Parks. Hi, I'll, I'll just say that having done both, 
I actually prefer the Zoom meetings. And I prefer them because I think they are more accessible to, um, to the public. I've been to meetings where there were elderly people or people who had other health conditions were having to go and then sit for two hours waiting for other matters <clears throat> to be discussed was very difficult for them. And I also, for me, it's travel time and parking and it's, I'm more comfortable <laughs> sitting where I am sitting right now, not because I don't want to talk to the public or see the public, but I'm just more comfortable here for three hours at night to be in my own home. Um, but the other thing is that I've been to meetings where a lot of people, neighborhood people will come and want to discuss an issue and it will really intimidate the petitioner because they feel like now there's this kind of negative pressure that's in person. And so, I, I initially really didn't like the Zoom meeting, but I have come to appreciate it. And so I'll just say that those things, I would not look forward to meeting again in person, although I like to see everybody in person, um, but it does add a half an hour on the beginning and the end of the day. And so I'm th that's my two cents. Other comments? Mr. Gilbert. Yeah, just echoing what uh, Ms. Parks mentioned, the you know biggest advantage to virtual Zoom meetings um, is accessibility for every member of the public, right? They don't have to travel. They don't have to work around schedules or you know circumstances that might prohibit them from being in person. They can simply log in, voice their opinion. And from what we have seen so far, right, at least in the past two years that I've been here on the board, is that even with that availability, there's not a whole lot of members of the public who are hopping on. So I think that um, you know it's a disservice to limit people's opportunity to participate. Also, personally, as a member of the ZBA, the reason that I'm able to be a full-time member is because this is virtual. Um, if this was an in-person thing, this is something that I would not be able to contribute my time and services to. And, you know, just again, echoing some of Tammy's comments from the comfort, could be comfort, could be scheduling. I work full time. Um, the, the simple fact is, is that I'm able to offer my, you know, time and services here to the town by virtue of this being uh, continued remote. Mr. Maxfield. Uh, I mean, I guess I gotta go, I gotta go in the opposite direction here because I, don't get me wrong. I like I like the uh, the convenience of uh, my home as well. You know, it's nice when we're uh, going through all of the, uh, the the specific findings and being able to uh, you know clean up some papers, uh, take care of a, a couple of things around the house while I'm listening to that. Lay here on my couch. Don't get me wrong. It's 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 certainly convenient, but the uh, I think the appeal of, of of doing this kind of work was for myself uh a way of of connecting with members of the community in person um i think was really the draw for me and i i i think part of when we're, we're certainly just doing um i think kind of kind of uh i don't know if you want to say rudimentary uh kind of approvals you know changing a sign to another sign or, or something like that in, in those cases, I, I think it doesn't really matter whether it's virtual or in person, but when you get to, I think, more contentious cases, I, I think there's a benefit from being in person as opposed to just a, a faceless person on a call uh, who's sharing uh, whatever their opinion is, is about the case. I think it can lead it to, to being more contentious. Um, and I think that there is a benefit to it being in person. We are a small community. I think we do benefit from coming together in that way. So I, I'm certainly more pro of, uh, of being in person. I know my, my term ends uh, this summer and I'm kind of holding off to see what happens, whether or not we, we go back to uh, fully in person or uh, stay, or if we stay fully a remote or if we can go to some sort of hybrid or some combination. Um, I think it's going to be the determining factor of whether or not I would be able to stay on this or whether I would choose to do another term, but it's, uh, 
if it comes down to us where we have some type of choice and what we would like to do, I would like to see some sort of hybrid, even if that hybrid is sometimes we're in person, sometimes we're remote. Um, that would be what something I would like to see. Uh, but I can certainly see uh, being fully in person, something that might be uh, not doable for, for most people. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Maxfield, Mr. Sloviter. Well, I'm an old guy who's been in business a long time, and I always believed that personal contact was very important, and I still do. But that said, I am very pleasantly surprised at, here at my first ZBA meeting of how effective this meeting was tonight by Zoom. I feel everyone was heard, evidence was presented well. I didn't feel that any corners were cut or that any part of the process suffered because it was a Zoom meeting. I also think that the public health issue, which a lot of people brush off as being basically finished, is not necessarily finished. And that, that working by Zoom um, is a very useful tool which I would not like to simply throw out because we all wanna to be together and, and that would of course be nicer. So before Zoom came into being, I would not have believed that it was this effective. I always leaned towards personal contact, but I think that all of these should be kept as options. Uh, a hybrid meeting is useful. A fully in-person meeting might be useful, especially if it's a, an application that is controversial or has a large public response. And I would be willing to defer to the chair to determine if a, an in-person meeting seems to be more required than not. I don't see anything about tonight's meeting that required an in-person meeting. So I... I think that continuing by Zoom or hybrid makes a lot of sense. It's far more convenient. And uh, if the weather is terrible, we don't have to go out. There's all sorts of advantages. And I think that Zoom works very well. So I think they should all be options and we should find a way to exercise the option that's most appropriate. Thanks. Um, Mr. O'Connor, I know you probably want to respond to some of those points because you've raised this originally, and I want to give you the chance to do okay, that. Yeah, I do have a couple of responses. Um, one, I think that um, the um, the concern about applicants being intimidated by by their neighbors. Well, that's that's the old if you can't stand the heat, you know, stay out of the kitchen. Um, if you if you don't want to hear what your neighbors have to say about your proposal, then maybe you shouldn't propose it. Um, and I, I do think, however it goes, I think this this matter should be not the matter, not the decision of a single individual who is not elected, but the decision of the boards and committees themselves based on their best judgment as to how they can best do their jobs. And uh, finally, um, for those who think it was a great meeting, I, part I participated by phone. There was no announcement about how to raise your hand by phone. I attempted to do so numerous times because um, even though I'm an associate member, I also am a member of the community who has some interest in Crocker Farm um, and the child who goes there. And I had some concerns about these proposals, the first two proposals, which I was unable to voice because I couldn't get recognized um, through this process, which everybody else seems to think is great. Um, and so I had, I spent, I listened a lot and I spent a, a lot of frustrated time trying at the appropriate moments to get recognized. And um, so it's not all, it, 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 
those who think that it worked fine, I can. I just want to assure you that it did not, um, and that a member of the public, I myself, who wanted to have something to say about the first two proposals, was unable to do so. Um, so, um, I think that, uh, and you know, and actually, I actually. <laughs> I'm pretty busy myself. I get up every morning before 6 o'clock to uh, drive people to work and school. And uh, So, Mr. O'Connor, just to, let's, let's just go, go with that point right there. First of all, I'm sorry that you didn't get on. Yeah. That's, that's a problem. Yeah, um, well, I, you know, I'm going to write the board a letter within the specified uh, statutory time period, and I hope the board will consider what I have to say. But, but, um, before they sign any decision, let's 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 do this. Um, part of the thing that I do in the beginning is try to tell people how they can access the meeting. If I think that if it wasn't clear, I should write in my opening statement. Uh, in, write in my opening statement something that makes it easier to get uh, to tell you how a, a, a telephone call in person would be able to access the meeting. Um, I know no, it's that not, has to be part of the that has yeah. to be part both at the beginning and when you ask for public comment. Yeah, exactly. Because it, it was not, not clear a, how to do that. I agree. And this is not so a, I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to put my comments in writing, but I do intend to do it. And I, I would ask as a courtesy that the board members who thought that they had heard all that was to be heard um, uh, not sign any uh, decision until they see my written comments. What I'm telling you is that I understand you had a problem. I'll try to fix it for the next one. Okay. Right. Um, but Mr. On this matter, I, yeah. I still have a concern and I hope the board will, will respect the fact that I tried to participate and was unable to do so. And I will put my comments in writing within the statutory period. And I hope that the board will take my comments seriously. Okay. We'll take a look at them. Please send it to Please send your comments to the staff. Please send them to Ms. Brestrup. Yeah, don't, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll right bring there. them in. It, yeah. I'll bring them in in writing. Yep. And don't send it to us directly because it's. Uh, yeah, no, I, I wouldn't have any way to know, to know how to do that anyway. All right. And then I didn't mean to cut you off. You were talking about. No, that's fine. I think I, ha I said what I had to say. All right. Good. I think Mr. McCarthy has his hand up. Mr. McCarthy? Yes, just for the record, Mr. Chair, the way to raise your hand on the phone is by pressing star nine. Okay, so we should. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, All right, but that's easy for me to include in the um, in future introductions and when we open up public comment. It's a problem we haven't had before, but I'm glad we know that now that there's something to do and we'll solve it. All right, any other discussions about the, so it looks, it seems to me, Ms. Brushbrook, it seems to me that we're not going to know whether we can meet in person or not, or we're not going to know whether the town has the resources for a hybrid meeting, or whether we're required to still have Zoom meetings until sometime after April 1st. And that that decision will be made by the town, if we are, if there is flexibility there, that decision will be made by the town council sometime after that. Is that right? Uh, that's right. Okay. Um, uh, so I I'm pus I'm thinking about what Mr. O'Connor said, and I know that um, if you're still in a meeting, even if you've closed the public hearing, I think you can open the public hearing to receive information as long as it's within the same meeting. Have you encountered that before, Mr. Judge? No, I haven't. I haven't encountered the fact that you could reopen. Well, you know, I. Um, if you wanted to reopen the public hearing on a different date, you would have to re notice um, everything. Re notice everything. And that's, you know, expensive and cumbersome. But I think on the same night that you can reopen the public hearing, but you, what you would have to do is vote to reopen the public hearing. And um, then hear what was going to be said and then vote to close the public hearing and 
unfortunately, the applicant, oh, one of the applicants is here. Mr. St. Hilaire is still here. So he would be able to hear the comments. It's just um, something you could consider. I'm pretty sure you're allowed to do that. You know, I I don't know that we're allowed to do that. And I'd hate to jeopardize, I don't know what the rules are, you know, and, and I hate to jeopardize the, um, the decision that we made on, on um, a unanimous basis mm -hmm. to do this on this with not knowing exactly what the implications of opening reopening it up without notice does that provide an ability to appeal I, I don't know what all the things are and I don't think you're it does appear to me that you're certain either at this I'm point that's certain no and I so I think and I also know that we can review what Mr. O'Connor wants to send us um, but the the meeting has taken place and the vote has taken place and um if we if we're going to open it up again we'd have to vote to open it up again we'd have to vote to to um have a uh, new notice so i'm not inclined to open it up at this point because of the uncertainty if we find out that um, we can in the future if we meet this have this situation that'd be good a good thing to know but i'm not inclined to open up the hearing again but i would if other people want to want to do that I'm open to it, but um, I'm not inclined to want to do that. May okay. I point out one other thing? Um, yes, it is possible also for people to submit um, comments in writing before the meeting. Mm -hmm. So if someone has you know strong comments about something, they can do that. Um, so we did not receive any comments before the no, meeting. No comments. So I guess meeting. my request would be two things. Ms. Prestrup, let's let's figure out what the what the answer to this question is in case this comes up again in the future. I don't want to create a, a potential legal a, a basis for appeal or a basis for a rejection of this based upon reopening it after we closed it because we we specifically voted to close them both. Mm -hmm. so let's find out what the answer is for the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, I guess now is the time for uh, Ms. Ms. Parks. I just wanted to add two things. I know it's not necessary, but the other thing I like about Zoom is that when I was talking about people being intimidated, there are a lot of people who are shy and doing public speaking, especially in front of an intimidating board, which is up on a, a raised panel, can be very uncomfortable. I myself have talked to the water board and it was very uncomfortable for me because I'm addressing this panel of people on high. But the other thing that I like about the Zoom meeting is that I can see everyone's face. And when I was in the live uh, ZBA meetings, often I would try to get the board's attention and it was difficult to do, or I couldn't really see what was happening with the other ZBA members. And for me, it's it's there's a value in me reading what's happening with people. If they're looking like they're not, they don't like something or they do like something. When you're sitting on the board, you can't really see each other. And so again, I just want to say that I also appreciate <laughs> those two things. I'm done. All right. Okay, Ms. Parks. All right, thank you. Um, if there's no other discussion, the next order of business is public comment on any matter before the, um, any matter except that which was before the board tonight. So anybody in the public can speak on any item, as long as it isn't dealing with the three uh, applications and, then, and the, uh, the discussion item we had tonight. Okay. With that, um, with no public comments, I guess the new business is just the ske upcoming schedule, Ms. Brestrup. I think we see, um, we talked about this a bit before the meeting began, but the next meeting is um, March 23rd, which is, we have something on Canton Avenue. Uh, Dylan, you're gonna cha chair the meeting. I don't think that um, Mr. Gilbert or I can be there, so we'll need to get um, associate members to fill two spaces. Mm -hmm. Um, four six is five fifteen Sunderland Road. Um, if you're not, if regular members are not available, let Chris know and we'll I'll get uh, we'll assign associate members to fill that. 
spaces. The next meeting after that is 413. There's a new nightclub. Uh, the spoke management wants to have a new nightclub and that's on 413. And we have a third meeting in April on 420. I think it's 427. And that we don't have an agenda for yet. No agenda. We All have right. cases in the wings, but we don't have anything teed up to go on that night. We have a new comprehensive permit coming up, a, a, la a large development with uh, of affordable housing. Is that something I've read about that? Is that something that we have before us or not? Yes, you have two comprehensive permits coming up. One is um, proposed for property on Ball Lane, okay. um, corner of Ball Lane and Route 63. And that's a relatively small project. I think it's 30 units, some of which are going to be market rate, but the bulk of them are going to be affordable. And those are going to be home ownership units. So that will be coming before oh. you. And then the second um, comprehensive permit is a larger one. That is um, one that the town put out a, an RFP on. And we're working with Wayfinders, who is a, um, an organization that builds affordable housing throughout this part of the state. And they are proposing, I believe it's 70 units altogether. And I think around 40 of those are affordable. Um, and that's on two sites. One is the East Street School site. And the other one is um, the Belchertown Road site that the town just purchased that's east of where the Sunoco station used to be on Belchertown Road. So those are the two comprehensive permits that will be coming before you. Okay. Those entail lots of work um mm -hmm. yep. uh, sorry we'll, we'll be doing some we'll we'll do some training we'll have a training session before we begin the comprehensive yep. permits again because there, it's a different process yeah. mr gilbert yeah very quickly chris uh was there a date on the wayfinders project i, I work for that organization not on that project but just to um have that on my radar is that something that i would have to sit out on there is no date yet. We haven't received an application. I think we've received a project eligibility letter mm -hmm. um, that went to the town and we have 30 days to respond, but um, we have not received an actual application yet. Okay. Um, I can confirm that internally and just uh, sort of be aware of that moving forward so that All right. Thank you. no conflict on my end. Great. Well, that those are two exciting things. That's great. All right. Um, any other new business? I'm if not, not no. nope, we're all set, I think. Um, if not, I guess the last, before I go to a vote, last thing is, Chris, you'll let us know what the legislature does, what the Senate does, and what the town has decided. And if you, if, if asked, uh, tell them if there is um, split feelings here in the ZBA. But that if there's if there is the money for greater bandwidth to allow hybrid, where you could have both, it might be a good it might be a good compromise. It would give people the ability to to do it conveniently. And those of us that would like the occasional uh, in person meeting, we could uh, do with that as do that as well. But that's a question of resources, and I don't know if the town has them. So um, it'd be something to think about. Okay. Well, thank you all. Um, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Maxfield moves. Mr. Yes, Mr. Slaughter. Sloviter. Second. second. Mr. Unmuted. Second. second. And this is not debatable. So the vote occurs on the motion. Chair votes aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Mr. Gilbert. Aye. Mr. Sloviter. Aye. Oh, you know, I'm going to get this right, Mr. Sloviter. Sorry. Yes, it's absolutely. It. I'm voting aye, no matter how you pronounce it. <laughs> Whatever I call you, you're going to vote aye on that. Right. <laughs> we all vote aye to adjourn, and we did it before nine. So, all right. Can I say one more thing. I wanted to thank Stephen McCarthy for stepping in to uh, do the Zoom master thing on this meeting because I can't do it. And thank you very much, Stephen. Yes. Thank you, Stephen. My pleasure, and thank you all for your service tonight. All right. Good night. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank good you. Night. Thank you all. Good night.